thank you very much for being here on time. Good morning. Let me start by introducing the Dean of the Business School at HKUST, Professor Karyan Tam, who's going to share with us some words of welcome. Karyan, please. Uh, Mr. Chris Hoy, okay, uh, Mr. Eddie Yu, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to welcome you in the HKUSD Business School Center uh, in Central. Uh, we use this facility for uh, teaching okay, in our part-time program. Because of the epidemics, okay, uh, we didn't uh, do too much teaching. So we use this venue okay, uh, to organize seminars okay, and workshops. So uh, this is the, uh, the third day of the CARE uh, 2022. Uh, today, we focus on policy and green finance. Now, what is green in the context of green finance? Each of us here is likely to have a somewhat different answer because green finance involves such a broad spectrum of stakeholders. Therefore, coordination is needed among all stakeholders. And to keep pushing the, uh, the frontier of knowledge in green finance, uh, here at HKUST Business School and the Environment of Division, uh, have been working very closely together uh, with the support okay, of uh, Christine, uh, who is very, very instrumental okay, in connecting uh, different academics together, which is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we successfully okay, received a, a major grant from the RGC uh, entitled Green Finance Theme-Based Research Project. Uh, hopefully, okay, through the research findings, uh, we can contribute a little bit okay, to advance Hong Kong as a green finance center. Uh, the team consists of uh, a number of scholars from different disciplines, including uh, business, economics, environmental science, engineering, uh, public policy, and information technology. We also okay, work closely with the regulator and also the government bureau uh, on this okay, a very important uh, topic. I would like to take this opportunity to thank okay, all of you okay, for supporting our work. Uh, the Green Finance Research Project employ a thing and do approach, uh, a concept actually initiated by, by Christine. Uh, we gather insights from academic research to bring ideas, develop technology prototypes, and proof of concept financial products. We don't just publish academic paper. We want our work to have an impact on society. So this is the spirit of think and do. Hong Kong's sprung to green transition is not a journey that any of us can walk alone. We hope that through our research project and other initiatives by the university, we can encourage more collaboration between the public and the private sector. The CARE conference uh, in these three days is an example of our efforts in promoting the collaborative spirit to keep everyone together on this think and do journey in helping Hong Kong achieve Carbon neutrality. Thank you very much. Hi, Anne, thank you very much. And before I go a little bit into the purpose of today, we'd like to have our opening speaker to share some perspectives with us. Of course, I know you know all him, Mr. Christopher Hoy, who's the Secretary for Financial Service and the Treasury. I just want to say that, Chris, thank you so much for coming. I know. Everybody is so busy, right? You've all been telling me how many conferences and seminars and workshops and internal meetings you've all been going to. I see this as a great sign. And green finance and sticking together finance and industries and business and academia is actually a key theme. I think we just need to kind of see how to align ourselves properly. And apart from Chris, after Chris, you will hear four other public sector officials speak. So Chris, you are leading the charge to help us to redefine uh, green policies in the finance sector for Hong Kong. And we thank you so much for giving us some time today. Please. Uh, Professor Tam, Professor Zhang, Christine, Eddie, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. I know this is the third day of this event. And I noted that, in fact, before me, we have actually four bureaus and nine government departments participating 
in this forum. So first of all, big thank you for having us on Monday, not on the weekends. And yeah. so at the same time, in appreciation, I took off my tie today and put on a green shirt uh, to, to, uh, to really appreciate the all the efforts that the organization has put in in fostering cross-disciplinary collaboration in this area. Because, because as you can see from the multiplicity of the government departments involved, this is really something cross-disciplinary. And that's why linkages across different schools, different disciplines is so important. And my special thanks, of course, for HKUSD for inviting me to join this very meaningful event. And also congratulations to all who have put in efforts to organize such a great event. And today, as highlighted by Christine, we are discussing the issue of global significance. So we need to look at this from a global context. At the COP27 recently took place in Egypt, it has been agreed among participants that the Paris Agreement would remain intact and the commitments are indeed reaffirmed and strengthened despite global headwinds. Also, there has been progress achieved across the board and the 1.5 degrees Celsius target for global temperature rise is still in sight. Moreover, participating parties agreed to set up a historic loss and damage fund at COP27 to support developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. We can see that despite difficulties and challenges of our times, concrete progress is still being made globally to address one of the biggest challenges facing mankind. Hong Kong as an international financial center connecting global capital with opportunities has a unique and indispensable role to play in this. In the following few minutes, please allow me to introduce to you our efforts around challenging, challenge, channel, channeling capital to empower green and sustainable development. We've been working in concert with our financial regulators, many of them are here today, and the industry, and taking a multi-pronged strategy to promote green and sustainable finance here in Hong Kong, providing the necessary infrastructure and catalyst. Good progress has been made for various initiatives and market development. Today, green and sustainable debt, including both bonds and loans issued in Hong Kong, quadrupled from 2020 to reach over 56 billion US dollars last year. Among others, the volume of green and sustainable bonds arranged in Hong Kong amounted to over 31 billion US dollars last year, accounting for one third of the Asian international green and sustainable bond market. This shows that the development of green and sustainable finance in Hong Kong offers promising prospects. By leveraging our advantages as an IFC, Hong Kong can facilitate matching between international capital and quality green projects, contribute proactively to helping our country achieve its 3060 target in relation to carbon emission peak and carbon neutrality, as well as propelling Hong Kong towards our carbon neutrality target before 2050 and promoting green transformation of our economy. The government has indeed took the lead to participate in the green and sustainable finance market. Since the establishment of the government green bond program back in 2018, the government has successfully issued close to 10 billion US dollars equivalent of green bonds, which were well received by investors. These inv includes our inaugural retail green bond totaling 20 billion dollars, I mean Hong Kong dollars, issued in May this year. Just to have a survey, any one of you has subscribed our green bonds? Anyone has got them? Oh, so basically congratulations to this group. So basically it's more like 100%. Uh, <laughs> I must say I, I didn't get any, so um, you're better than me. So uh, It was the world's largest re green bond retail tranche at issuance, and we will expand the issuance of government green bonds with an increase in the total issuance amount by more than five times within the five years from 2021-2022 as compared with the pre-2021-2022 period. We are also exploring to launch a pilot issuance of tokenized green bonds targeting institutional investors under the green bond program. We have shared this via a previous policy statement published for the development of virtual assets in Hong Kong. That is another hot topic to discuss and we are exploring how financial innovation can empower green transformation. Besides the government's initiatives, it is equally important to promote private sector participation 
under the Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme as of early as December this year, we have granted close to 150 million Hong Kong dollars to over 170 green and sustainable debt instruments issued in Hong Kong. We welcome and encourage more bond issuers and loan borrowers to make use of this scheme and issue more green and sustainable bonds and also loans here in Hong Kong. Further on that, to promote sustainable development of this sector, nurturing talent is crucial. Having regard to the new trend of developing new carbon and also sustainable economy, we have earmarked 200 million Hong Kong dollars to launch the three-year pilot green and sustainable finance capacity building support scheme to provide subsidies for the training and acquisition of relevant professional qualifications in sustainable finance as part of a collaborative effort to build capacity for the industry. We have been liaising and communicating with stakeholders in the industry and course providers on the implementation details. And we have began accepting applications for registration as an eligible program since late October this year. The scheme will be officially launched very soon. When I say very soon, I really mean very soon. So the eligibility requirements and procedures for subsidy application by individuals, the first batch of eligible programs, as well as other details will be published soon. So do look out for the details once we make them known to the community. Also formed by the relevant government bureaus and financial regulators with Eddie there as well, the Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Group launched the Sustainable Finance Lead Internship in Initiative in October this year to create more sustainable finance internship opportunities in Hong Kong for students, facilitating them to gain relevant hands-on experience and supporting the development of the Green and Sustainable Finance Talent Pool here in Hong Kong. So I understand many of you are from banks. Any of you are participating, offering internships there? Anyone? Thank you, big thank you. And last but, but definitely not the least, we have been joining hands with financial regulators to take forward various measures to develop Hong Kong into a global, high quality, voluntary carbon market. And we have a Ken from HAEX later on. I'm sure that he's going to share more details. HAEX signed an MOU with the Guangzhou-based China Emissions Exchange back in March this year to explore collaboration in carbon market financing. And in July this year, HKEX launched the Hong Kong International Carbon Market Council, which aims to build momentum in the development of an efficient and effective Hong Kong-based international carbon market. And in October this year, HKEX launched Core Climate, a new international carbon marketplace that facilitates effective and transparent trading of carbon credits and instruments. Core Climate participants can trade voluntary carbon credits to neutralize or compensate for the buyer's carbon emissions. This is a key step towards developing Hong Kong into a global, high-quality, voluntary carbon market and consolidating Hong Kong's position as a green and sustainable finance hub in the region. I was at the launch ceremony. I must say that I was quite touched by the event because normally the pay players that I see there, like China Forestry, uh, the power companies, you don't really see them in the Connect Hall apart from a IPO event. But here is a special event where you really bring together the real economy people, the finance people together. And as I said by the professor just now, sometimes it's not very easy to connect them. So we are trying our best to do so. Coral Climate is currently the only carbon marketplace in the globe that offers Hong Kong dollar and RMB settlement for the trading of international voluntary carbon credits. All projects available on Cloud Climate, including carbon avoidance, reduction and removal projects, are verified against the verified carbon standard by VERA. The platform recorded more than 40 trades in less than a month between 28th October and 24th of November this year, representing a total volume of around 400,000 tons of carbon credits. I was told that this number is actually bigger than other platforms that has been launched in other jurisdictions. So something that you need to know when you share that information with your friends. And looking forward, HAEX will continue to actively expand the carbon trading ecosystem, including expanding prototypes and services, improving trading mechanisms and infrastructure, exploring the development of relevant standards applicable to Hong Kong, and promoting the transformation towards a low-carbon economy in the region. 
with a view to developing Hong Kong into a leading international carbon market. Ladies and gentlemen, we will continue our efforts and work closely with the financial sector and relevant stakeholders to develop and promote Hong Kong as a green and sustainable hub in the region. We will leverage the enormous opportunities presented by the GBA development and the Belt and Road Initiative to serve as a premier financing platform and will facilitate international and mainland green enterprises and projects in raising funds through issuing bonds, funds, IPOs, and other channels. And I hope today's conference will bring us more wisdom and insights as we chart the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoy. Thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hoy. Um, this, uh, I'd like to share with you, uh, together with Christine, my partner, about the, the outcomes from uh, the first day uh, on Saturday. Uh, come outcomes. Uh, first of all, um, we had the best uh, world expert on climate science to share with us uh, on the latest status uh, on the climate change. And uh, from the COP27, we now understand that we are still heading towards a 2.5 degrees to 3 degrees uh, temperature change uh, increase by the end of the century relative to the pre-industrial uh, period. And so um, this is still well above the Paris Agreement's two degree target. Third of all, we have to prepare for extreme weather, uh, like uh, more severe typhoons, uh, more severe flooding, uh, landslides, uh, storm surge, and heat waves, as we have already experienced uh, in the past summer. And this also are the climate risk that the community needs to uh, assess, uh, especially for the financial disclosure for ESG. And um, Hong Kong also uh, need to uh, adapt to all these uh, uh, risks uh, and also in increase our resilience. Uh, turning to the workshop that I moderated uh, about the resilience and uh, preparations, uh, we recognize the need to scale up our current um, forecasting and response uh, actions, of, and also um, to foster regional collaboration within the GBA as extreme weather doesn't see any boundaries. And also, uh, severe weather can come at the same time together. This is what we call uh, multi-hazard scenarios. For climate risk, uh, I think uh, many of you will be interested in, um, we have our uh, major uh, infrastructures uh, like the power companies, like the airport. They are already preparing uh, for the worst scenario. So that is really good news. We have very sound infrastructures. However, other stakeholders may have different risk appetite. Uh, for example, due to different locations, due to their different um, circumstances. Therefore, um, I, we think that uh, it is not a, a one-size-fits-all uh, situation. And not, again, on the, uh, on the risk uh, assessment issue, uh, our researchers are all, also looking into the uh, topic about, um, apart from the primary risk, like uh, typhoon flooding and uh, storm surge, heavy rain, this uh, could bring secondary risk, uh, like uh, flooding the MTR, uh, and other facilities, which could also bring even tertiary risk that we are not yet uh, aware. So further research will be needed uh, in order to guide Hong Kong uh, in the future. Another area that uh, we, uh, we, have recon we begin to recognize is the awareness of the risk uh, of climate is right, rather low in the community. So uh, we feel that uh, we need to uh, reach out further and also to in increase the collaboration uh, with the stakeholders uh, to raise the awareness, to increase the understanding uh, so that we could uh, work together and, and uh, uh, evaluate the risk. Finally, heat waves is, uh, is a big problem as we can see this year. We have 15 days of uh, temperature higher than 35 degrees. In the past, we only have such only one day uh, in a year. So uh, we need to uh, uh, 
work together uh, with all the stakeholders and, and collaboration uh, to cool our city. Uh, so this is uh, my part and uh, I hand over to uh, Christine. Right. Thank you. Also, I want to share some observations with you about day one. The, it's important because uh, we're trying to do something that is different from what has happened before. And I know afterwards you will have, in a way, three teams of you who are in the room to share a very broad view about climate with everybody. Everybody has complained to me that I'm only giving them five minutes. <laughs> and it's a very high art to actually give us a lot of substance for five minutes. But I believe all of you have been drilling yourself for speaking today. And we have the same restrictions for people on Saturday. The reason we're doing this is because we seldom have a chance to all sit together from many diverse disciplines. And, you know, in the room, I think many of you know each other and you may not know everybody, but I think you know that everybody in the room today is actually very influential and very senior in your sector. We don't often sit together. And one of the things, the takeaway on Saturday was the morning was a government show. So as Chris Ho explained to us, you know, we actually have like nine government departments, four bureaus. And they gave a show that I don't think Hong Kong has seen. And it was a show that, you know, slightly technical because this is mostly development bureau telling us what are some of the hardware stuff. You know, after the science, right, we talked about hardware, how they're dealing with it. And some people came up to me afterwards, including some people from the financial sector saying, we never heard that before. So I think one observation is we actually have tremendous talent in Hong Kong. We have a tremendous amount of work actually going on. But people in different sectors don't all know. And sometimes that creates uh, some frustration, you know, or maybe some questions about whether something is happening. But the difficulty is identifying gaps and where we need to reprioritize. Those are always difficult discussions. So one observation that I have is, how do we enter into this zone where we discuss the great work that is being done and people need to know, and also identify the gaps and where are some areas we might need to reprioritize? Because those are difficult discussions. And I'd like to think that universities are useful because we are neutral. And we do have a lot of scholars and experts uh, in our midst, including people like CM, who's been my partner in crime in organizing this. And I must say, the Hong Kong Observatory, we're very proud in Hong Kong to actually have very experienced and distinguished climate scientists. It may not be known by people, particularly in the financial sector, but I assure you, Hong Kong has some of the top people uh, in our government and in our universities on climate science. So do use them, you know, do involve them in uh, your thinking. So that's my first observation. My second observation is people really want discussion and dialogue, exploration. We're not yet at a point where we can maybe make all the decisions. And of course, many of the decisions are really important and have to be made by government. That's why people are very keen to interact with different departments. What we don't have are perhaps effective platforms for deliberation, because you have to go back home and make your own decisions. Government have to go back to uh, within their department and the government as a whole to make decisions. But I think what we all want are neutral platforms where we can explore the gaps and the priorities and the difficulties, and also areas where we are doing well. <clears throat> Hong Kong is not a basket case by any measure. So how can we create new platforms that are neutral, that allows us to explore and learn from each other? I think there's a great interest in that. And lastly, there were voices coming from young people, but also amongst yourselves, of how can we engage in this revolution? Because dealing with climate change, Reviving biodiversity is a revolution. We don't actually know how to do it. And all of you sitting here, I know, are trying different ways, learning, you know, getting the data, understanding what the data is telling us, and making decisions and finance. 
no money, no talk, right? So where's the money coming from? Hong Kong is extremely fortunate that we have a government that is quite well endowed. And as, uh, uh, as you reminded us, Chris, you know, government is spending money, serious money on all sorts of things. So there are various opinions in the community about how to maximize the effectiveness of the money that Hong Kong has. So again, having effective dialogue that are well, you know, well managed, where we can have observation and clarity on what we can do in different sectors and together, that would be very helpful. Let me say that Chris has spoken, Eddie is going to share some perspective with us, and then we're going to start off with three people from amongst the public sector, HKMA, SFC, and the stock exchange. So actually, we're having five people from the public sector. And hopefully you will, after you've spoken, you would have given us a, a good kaleidoscope uh, from the financial perspectives. And afterwards, we'll have uh, uh, many views from you, right, from five minutes. But we also like to leave time to hear from you all afterwards. So Eddie, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Christine, for remembering me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and thanks very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about um, collaboration in green finance policy and ecosystem enhancement. And here, collaboration is the key word. It's very important because by the name, uh, as you can see by the name, Green and sustainable finance has to cut across different disciplines, environmental and financial. And even within finance, climate risk means different things to different sectors, like you know, addressing climate risk in banking, how to be a responsible asset manager, or even you know, how to calculate insurance coverage for losses arising from climate risk. Uh, and then there's also the interplay with the real sector. Uh, in fact, if you look at the direct carbon footprint of the financial sector, it's only very small. Uh, we can reduce our air travel, we can reduce the energy consumption in our offices, uh, but the impact is actually extremely small when compared with the real sector, for example, when you think about a steel plant. Uh, but in the bigger scheme of things, the role of finance is actually very big. When you think about uh, finance being a catalyst or incentive provider, to help the real sector to respond to climate change. Uh, and a lot of collaborative work in green finance has been done through the umbrella uh, of the Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Committee, which was initiated by the HKMA and SFC back in 2020 uh, in order to serve as a platform to coordinate the efforts of the government uh, agencies, the regulators, the industry, uh, and also the academia. And here, the spirit is that there are actually two, uh, two objectives. One is to make sure that across different financial regulators, we adopt the same standards and same approach so that it's much easier for the fin financial institutions to get to tra into transition finance when they deal with different fi uh, financial regulators. And the second is, like Christine said, uh, if we want to push green and sustainable finance in Hong Kong, it's got to be a collaborative effort. So we want to bring everybody in on the same platform for development. In fact, Hong Kong UST is a very active participant, and uh, you've been helping us co-chair one of our working groups on capacity uh, building, for which we're grateful. So let me now spend a few minutes uh, to talk about the various initiatives driven by the steering uh, group. Uh, and, and like Christine said, uh, the, the way that we work is think and also do. It's important to really not just talk about policies, but to really do things that can benefit the ecosystem. And here we're focusing on three areas. One is regulation. Second is infrastructure and ecosystem. Uh, and third is markets, how to create markets. Um, first, let me talk about regulation. The important thing here is to set clear rules, consistent clear rules uh, for the financial industry. At the very basic, we want to make sure that financial institutions can properly account for the climate risk in their day-to-day -day operations, and that the emissions and climate risk information will not be inflated or underestimated. And that's why the HKMA has issued a supervisory policy manual, 
uh, last December, requesting banks to incorporate climate considerations in their governance strategy, risk management, and importantly, disclosure. And similarly, uh, SFC is requiring all fund managers to, click, to take climate risk uh, into consideration in their investment uh, and also in their risk management and disclosure. Very similar standards and requirements. And regulators in Hong Kong have also made a very uh, early commitment to adopt global disclosure standards. It's been evolving. Uh, but back in uh, 2020, we've already required all financial institutions in Hong Kong to follow the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD, uh, and they need to comply with it in, uh, by 2050. UK, I think, was the first to make this commitment, and Hong Kong is the first in Asia uh, to make this uh, commitment. And we are now also supporting the work of the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, uh, in setting the global baseline of uh, sustainability disclosure. And we will follow uh, ISSB uh, standards uh, when uh, further refining the disclosure requirements in Hong Kong. Uh, and second is about building the uh, infrastructure and building the ecosystem. And here, the purpose is to provide the industry with the right incentive and capability to go green. And when you think about the key challenges in creating the green ecosystem, there are two. One is talent, the second is data. And on talent, I think uh, Chris has already covered a lot. Um, there are two areas that we are, uh, we, are, we are working on. First is to uh, train up the local students, local practitioners uh, in the financial sector. And second is to bring in overseas experienced people. That's important as well. And for locals, we offer a combination of training opportunities and also incentives. We started off by really just very simple thing, collating and sharing the information about high quality courses on green finance. Most people do not know what's available out there. So we've uh, created a centralized platform with all this information. Uh, and we've also, we are also developing a regulator-approved regulator knowledge framework. It's called Enhanced Competency Framework. Uh, that will, uh, and, and that's for banking uh, practitioners, and that is already nearing completion. And building on this, uh, Chris has mentioned that um, the government has got a capacity building uh, support scheme uh, to subsidize people to get training. And to expand the local talent pool, we also need our young people to get interested in this emerging field. Uh, and we need to better connect our young people to the industry to deepen their understanding of the subject and also um, the career uh, prospects that are uh, in this area and also to inspire them to get into this field. And here we, uh, we've launched the Sustainable Finance in Internship Initiative, uh, offering new opportunities for uh, students to get a hands-on experience uh, on what green, uh, green uh, finance is. For overseas people, we believe that uh, they will be attracted by the plentiful uh, opportunities in Hong Kong. Uh, but we also want to make sure that uh, the process for them to come in is straightforward and if they do, do decide to come. So uh, the government has added um, the ESG financial professionals in the talent list uh, for entering Hong Kong. And professionals with skills in this subject area uh, who are in the talent list, they can come to Hong Kong more easily uh, without having to secure a job offer before, uh, before they come here. And also they can bring, bring in their dependents. Uh, the second area, the second challenge is uh, data. And here we're doing a lot of work in the uh, cross-sector, uh, cross-agency steering group. Uh, one is to pull together the data that's now scattered in different government departments. We've got a lot of data in observatory, in the drainage department, in the other sci science scientific uh, bureau. But we need to put them together into a central repository. And we've just created this repository. Uh, so that the industry and the practitioners can access those data uh, very easily. Uh, the second thing is really to um, produce data analytics uh, for the industry to use, so that if they want to access this data, they don't have to develop their own program uh, in order that they can get a useful analysis uh, using this data. And these um, um, Emissions estimation, estimation too will be freely accessible uh, in future. And we are developing that uh, together with the industry and, uh, and the universities. 
Um, building on this cross-cutting regulatory framework and ecosystem, the third part of our strategy is to give an extra push to specific uh, and promising markets. Uh, the obvious priority is green and sustainable bonds, uh, like what Chris said, is an area that we're focusing on. Uh, in fact, we are building on um, our role, Hong Kong's role as Asia's leading fundraising center. In fact, you know, we're not only strong in equities, but if, if you look at the uh, bond market, we're actually the largest uh, bond market issuance center in Asia <coughs> uh, for international bond issuance. Uh, and in... Uh, just in 2021, Hong Kong has already issued 200 billion US dollars of bonds. And more specifically, in the green space, we've already established ourselves as Asia's leading green finance hub. And uh, Chris has mentioned the numbers. In 2021, uh, the total green bond and loan issuance was 56 billion US dollars. And that's the largest uh, in Asia. And it's increasing, uh, continuing to increase even this year when debt market, uh, market conditions are so difficult uh, for bond issuance. Uh, and to set the benchmark and also create the demonstrative effect, uh, we supported the uh, government in, uh, in creating the government green bond program, which is important because it's not really only about creating benchmark, bringing in new instruments. Uh, for example, in green bond issuance, it's not really just in US dollar and Hong Kong dollar, but we try out Euro, we try our RMB, and we've extended the benchmark into a much longer one. But more importantly, the government green bond program also brings in the ecosystem because with that huge volume of issuance, we're bringing in the accountants, lawyers who understand ESG. We're bringing in the green reviewers who have established offices in Hong Kong. So this ecosystem will stay to support the private green bond issuance. And we also recognize that sometimes a tangible form of support is needed to help issuers overcome inertia and take the important first step in green, uh, green bond issuance. It's the nudge that you need. Sometimes these nudges are small, but they can push the issuers into issuance. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the green and sustainable finance grant scheme that uh, Chris was talking about. The government is subsidizing the green bond review costs, which is not much. But it's, it's very effective. Just in the last year, we've got more than 100 issuers coming to Hong Kong to issue green bonds for the first time using this grant. And also, our target is not really just corporate issuers, but also government entities. And since last year, we've supported uh, Shenzhen and also Hainan governments to come to Hong Kong to, for the first time to issue mainland, local government, offshore sustainable bonds in Hong Kong. Uh, and that's important because when you think about the um, transition financing needs of the mainland, uh, it's trillions uh, in the coming 10, 20 years. Uh, and if they need global capital to finance that transition, it's got to be in Hong Kong. Because this is the place where international standards are adopted and where global investors are comfortable to buy the bonds here, which follow international standards. And that's why We've got Shenzhen and uh, Thailand governments coming here. And to create the demonstrative effect to bring the corporates and other government entities to issue here. So I would envisage Hong Kong's green bond market will actually be a center where global capital meets the transition needs of China. And also, on the other hand, apart from um, the uh, attracting green bond issuers uh, and creating the markets here, we in the exchange fund, because we are the biggest asset manager in town, we need to lead by example. So we fully incorporated ESG into our whole investment process. It's not really just the public markets. We've been investing in green bonds since 2015. We're increasing the portion we're allocating to that. We are investing in green ESG equities by first by index link uh, uh, man through index link managers. Uh, but now uh, with a bigger mandate uh, on an active basis. Also, in private markets, we're actively getting into, into the ESG space. Uh, in fact, the, the, one of the first direct investments that we made uh, in Europe was in uh, renewables. And that got us really nice return, two, more than two times in return. So it's actually a very profitable area that can also contribute to good costs. So um, to lead by example, the exchange fund has fully incorporated ESG principles in our investment. 
Um, of course, carbon credit is another area that uh, we are focusing on together with the government. And Hong Kong X uh, has been introducing, like Chris said, uh, the, core, uh, the core climate uh, platform. Uh, it's, it's important because it's an area that will only continue to develop. But in the beginning, uh, it will be a bumpy road. It won't be easy. The standards are not there. Uh, the market is not there. Uh, the volume and the liquidity, we need time to create. And we all need to be patient in creating new markets. Uh, and I think there's a lot that we can do, especially, again, by connecting global capital with the carbon market in China. Hong Kong has to be the bridge. Hong Kong has to be the, the, the gateway. And I understand that um, my colleagues from the HMA and also other agencies will be presenting many of the initiatives that I talk about in more detail. So I will stop here uh, and not delve into the details. Uh, and I hope I've given you already an overview of what we are trying to do, achieve, uh, and also where we are now. Uh, as I said in the beginning, making green finance work requires collaborative efforts from all stakeholders, including all of you here. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, in this important area uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you for a very solid update of what's happening and kind of getting us a bit excited about your work. Um, now I'm going to introduce my other partner in crime, Simon Ng, who's the CEO of uh, Business Environment Council, one of our regular partners and supporters who will emcee the first panel. Well, thank you, Christine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been given the tough task to keep time and make sure that the program will flow smoothly this morning because we have a very packed program, a lot of heavyweight speakers. So in this panel, actually, we have nine speakers going to share with us their insight uh, in a short presentation, one by one, uh, contributing to the topic, climate change preparedness, green finance, and talent. So may I first invite the first three speakers, um, and they are Mr. Hoi Cho Hoi, Head of uh, Banking Policy, Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Please take a seat on the stage. Thank you. And next is Ms. Megan Tang, Senior Director of Corporate Finance Division, Securities and Futures Commission. And then uh, last but not least, Mr. Ken Chu, Senior Vice President, Head of Carbon and ESG, Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing. So what we're going to do is we'll have our first three presentations, one after another. And we'd like to first invite Mr. Hoi to the podium. Mr. Hoi, please. Good morning. Thank you for Hong Kong USD invitation to let me share our thoughts on public related financial risk. This issue is a high priority in the agenda of the international regulatory committee, including the HKMA. To have robust climate risk management, one of its area is to work on how the physical and transition risk associated with climate change impact the loss generating process from, for banks. It's the central for informed assessments of policy options and the calibration of any potential changes to our regulatory requirement. Climate-related scenario analysis, including threat tests, seems like a useful tool to help understand the range of potential impact in a forward-looking manner. In this connection, the HKM may um, conduct a pilot climate threat test for the banking sector last year. The pilot threat test provides um, useful insight into the climate risk profile of the banking sector. And the participating bank also benefited from enhanced capacities for assessing climate risk. Our premium results show that the threat testing result is quite substantial under some severe scenarios. Another source of risk is from the link between climate change and cyclical dynamics of the global economy. Climate change and the related financial amplifiers are likely to change the 
severity or duration of the business cycle. And such changes could be long lasting. This linkage is critical for climate risk measurement, in particular, its potential impact on banks' capital requirement. Given the deep uncertainty about climate change, its potential economic impact, and data gap in climate-related financial risk, we have to make available a taxonomy with, a, with the core elements of our local greens classification framework, as well as climate-related data and analytics. These tools addresses the major challenge, challenges faced by banks, including the lack of reference data and technological solutions for assessing physical and transition risk. Well, it's important for financial institutions to take appropriate actions to respond to the adverse effect of climate change. Climate change is equally important for them to contribute to the global effort in making the impact of climate change less severe by reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. The financial sector could play a role in channeling more capital resources to greener business and those with lower carbon emissions in line with one of the objectives of the Paris Agreement. It does not mean that financial sector should only lend money to green industry, or more, more importantly, the financial sector should also help smooth the transition by supporting local greens or even brown companies to become greener or more sustainable to avoid disruptive financial exclusion for some of the traditional industries. Therefore, there is much effort to make broader adjustments to regulatory requirements in order to facilitate transition finance and at the same time ensure the safety and soundness of our financial system. To achieve robust climate risk management and the goal of net zero emissions, um, as Eddie says, we have issued the supervisory um, policy manuals and this year, we also developed a two-year plan to embed climate risk into our own supervisory process, such that ongoing supervisory guidance is provided for banks to incorporate climate change consideration in their business strategies and risk management frameworks. This process required the holistic support and participation of the whole community. Therefore, it's useful to have more collaboration among the industry regulators and research institutions to overcome the challenges that we face. So I stop here, and I think I make the time. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Hoi. Please take a seat. Um, thank you for your sharing and perfect time management. Coming up next, we have uh, Ms. Megan Tang. Uh, Ms. Tang is going to talk about climate-related disclosure. Ms. Tang. Good morning. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk about the SFC's work on climate-related corporate reporting. Now, the SFC has been at the forefront of local and global efforts to create an effective regulatory framework for green and sustainable finance. An important aspect is our work with EX to incorporate the climate-related reporting standards proposed by ISSB in March of this year as part of Hong Kong's reporting framework for listed companies. Now, the availability of useful, reliable, and comparable climate-related data will facilitate informed investment decisions, proper pricing of financial products, and help tackle greenwashing. It is also sensible for our listed companies to assess the financial implications associated with the transition to a lower carbon economy and an increase in climate-related physical risk. There is strong momentum globally towards establishing a baseline for corporate sustainability disclosures, and the consensus is that climate should be first and foremost on the agenda. Compared to the 2017 TCFD recommendations, the ISSB standards require additional 
and more granular information from reporting entities, but they are also mostly aligned. This is good news because the revisions that were made to EX's um, ESG reporting guide in July 2020 were based on TCFD recommendations. So the compliance work that has been carried out by our listed companies will remain relevant for ISSB compliance. Many Hong Kong listed companies are already aware that mandatory climate-related reporting is pending, but they are at different stages of readiness. And they also face very different challenges depending on their industry, size, geography, and management. Also, unlike other major regions, most jurisdictions in Asia Pacific, including the mainland and Hong Kong, are just beginning to introduce climate-related reporting, and most jurisdictions do not have plans yet <laughs> to, require, to require this disclosure for unlisted companies. So this information may therefore be less readily available within the value chains of companies operating in this region. Time is needed for companies to select an enterprise-wide approach that is suitable for their situations and to develop appropriate internal systems, controls, and processes. There are encouraging signs of progress. Based on the review of 400 listed companies' ESG reports in 2021, the exchange found that 93% of them are already reporting scope one or two emissions. An informal study carried out by the SFC on 300 listed companies found that a third of them are reporting aggregate scope three emissions, and a third are also, have also announced quantified emissions reduction targets within specified timeframes. Now, around 20% have conducted scenario analysis, and 10% have begun to develop a transition plan. For the global baseline to take hold, it is critical that requirements can be implemented across different jurisdictions and organizations to have global convergence and limit fragmentation. To enhance consistency across the region, the SFC has been engaging with the CSRC in the mainland and securities regulators in other parts of Asia Pacific to exchange views on ISSB's proposed requirements, applicability, and implementation challenges for our markets. We have given direct feedback to ISSB and also contributed to IOSCO's technical analysis of these proposals. In our comments to ISSB, we pointed out that emerging economies and small medium enterprises are likely to face challenges in meeting the requirements in near future, and they will require a transition period. We suggested that ISSB considers including some phasing in measures and also guidance for preparers, which would be conducive in promoting both voluntary and mandatory adoption of the global baseline. In a recent update, the ISSB indicated that it is considering the development of guidance to help entities apply some aspects of its requirements. According to a recent PwC survey, global ESG-related asset under management is expected to grow significantly, and Asia-Pacific is projected to have fastest growth rate, rising to 3.3 trillion US dollars by 2026, from 1 trillion US dollars last year. We believe that Hong Kong is well positioned to capture the benefits of this growth and contribute to the mainland's transition to net zero as a fundraising center. As I mentioned at the outset, we are working with the stock exchange to devise a framework and roadmap for listed companies to comply with ISSB-related requirements. Our aim is to be ambitious but practical. We're evaluating possible ways to provide appropriate flexibility for companies that are still working towards alignment with ISSB and to accommodate evolving international standards. More prescriptive rules will be included where appropriate to achieve comparability, but there will also be implementation guidance and signposting to publicly available resources to provide additional support for companies. 
EX is aiming to launch the public consultation as soon as practicable after ISSB standards are finalized. And I look forward to hearing the feedback to the consultation and working together to implement the ISSB standards in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tang. Please take your seat. Now I would like to invite Mr. Ken Chu uh, to the podium. Um, he's going to talk about connecting capital with climate opportunity. Mr. Chu, please. Thank you. Mr. Ho, Mr. Yu, uh, Professor Tam, Christine, I'm very pleased and delighted to speak today in the conference, and thank you for UST, my mother school, for inviting. Hong Kong EX have multi roles. We list a company, a regulator, a market operator. In all three, we see ourselves as change agents in global markets. As a pioneer in the carbon and ESG space, Hong Kong EX is committed to leading the development of an international carbon market in Hong Kong, mainland China, Asia, and beyond. Leveraging Hong Kong as an asset IFC, unreserved support and guidance from the government and regulators, supreme connectivity with mainland and the rest of the world, sound regulatory regimes and efficient infrastructure. Hong Kong EX has taken several initiatives to contribute to sustainability and the development of Hong Kong carbon market. We've been very, working very closely with different authorities and stakeholders to build a long-term sustainable financial market. Last November, Hong Kong EX joined the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero and the Net Zero Financial Service Providers Alliance, part of our ongoing commitment to the long-term sustainable development of global financial market. In March 2022, HKEX signed MOU with the China Emission Exchange, Guangzhou, to collaboratively explore uh, a collaboration in carbon market and ESG space within the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. HKEX also established the Hong Kong International Carbon Market Council in July and welcomed 12 leading corporates and financial institutions as inaugural council members to collectively explore carbon markets and beyond in the region. This is one of the critical measures in order to bring financial industry and the real economies together. All these initiatives lead to the foundation for Hong Kong EX to launch a brand new market in Hong Kong, Core Climate, in October. The current focus for Core Climate is voluntary carbon credit product. Core Climate provides an easy access, one stop, and integrated carbon marketplace that includes trading and settlement functions for the participants. Our participants can purchase, sell, settle, custody, and retire international recognized voluntary carbon credits, for example, Vera, through the platform. Since its launch, the platform has been very well received by the market. Here, I would like to add a, little, a, a couple of highlights or supplementary information uh, for core climate. And that's include a little bit about our thought process when we develop this market. For the time being, in Hong Kong, we do not have an emission trading system or the mandatory carbon market like mainland China, nor carbon, or, nor carbon tax arrangement like Singapore. As such, positioning the Hong Kong international carbon market in voluntary uh, market space has become a natural choice. As the only international carbon market in mainland, it's complementary to the existing national and provisional carbon markets onshore. Core Climate is the only international marketplace where carbon credits can be denominated and settled in Hong Kong dollar and RMB. This is critical because nowadays carbon uh, voluntary carbon credits are predominantly denominated in USD and Euro. This will also help us to position RMB in the international space. Core Climate can successfully resolve several long-standing pain points, though very simple, in international voluntary carbon market. For example, counterparty risk, credible in, uh, and integrity carbon credit sourcing, cross-jurisdictional legal framework. It helps cater the needs of climate instruction for real economy entities to satisfy, for example, international quasi-mandatory decarbonization requirements along the global supply chain, 
For example, you might have heard a lot of different multinational corporates that impose some sort of carbon neutral requirement to their supply, suppliers and list the company's disclosure requirement as well. In the longer run, HKEX will continue to pioneer good governance and ESG excellence. We'll press ahead with the long-term sustainable development of a scalable carbon market in Hong Kong, building up our network and alliance with our partners. We'll focus on further expanding our product spectrum and engaging with our regulators and stakeholders to capture opportunities in the full climate value chain. We'll build liquidity, credibility, and participant stickiness in our carbon market. Like what Chris mentioned and, and Eddie mentioned, building market is critical. This will help us achieve the ultimate goal of having a transparent, reliable, and setting price discovery mechanism for carbon products in Hong Kong. Finally, I would like to emphasize what we have done is just the first and small step. There are a lot to be done. I understand there are a lot of exciting development to be announced today, and I am looking forward to work with your closely down the road to collaborate on this decarbonization journey. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Chiu. Um, thank you once again for Mr. Hui, Ms. Tang, and Mr. Chiu, and please give them another round of applause. And please take a seat uh, in the audience. Thank you. Now, after listening to the regulators and the public sectors, I'd like to bring other stakeholders into the conversation. And coming up next, we have Mr. Adrian Lee uh, of the Bank of East Asia. Unfortunately, Mr. Lee is uh, under the weather uh, today. And so in place of him, we have Ms. Soe Lau, General Manager and Group Head of People and Sustainability of the Bank of East Asia. So uh, please welcome Ms. Lau to the stage. Um, so you can uh, use the stage and thank you. And also we have a timer here, um, just in case you need to manage your time. <laughs> thank you, Zoe. Great. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to join, I think Mr. Christopher Hoy has left. <laughs> Mr. Eddie Yu has left as well. Professor Christine Lowe um, and our other distinguished presenters, and I think Professor Tam is also outside. I was going to say hi to him because he is an acquaintance from one of my previous roles. Um, today, uh, I will share our views on the climate challenge from the perspective of the Bank of East Asia as a Hong Kong-based, homegrown bank. In the years since the signing of the Paris Agreement in 2015, banks have been increasingly regarded as playing a strategically important role in helping to limit global warming to 1.5 Celsius between pre-industrial levels and the end of the century. The global transition to a low carbon economy is expected to require investments of at least four to six trillion US dollars each year. Delivering such funding will require a swift and comprehensive transformation of the world's financial system. Engaging governments, central banks, commercial banks, institutional investors, and other financial sectors. We at BA are in the process of carrying out our own transformation. We have established an ESG vision to be the sustainability leader among financial institutions in Greater China and beyond. In establishing the vision, our primary intention has been to give our staff members a clear sense of the kind of organization we want to be. Being the sustainability leader may be ambitious, but ultimately, we believe that it is within our reach. Excellence in sustainability does not require deep pockets or a massive workforce. What it does require is an enabling company culture that embraces sustainability principles and engages and inspires staff members to contribute to the company's vision. We realize that the long-term success of our organization depends on our ability to meet the expectations of our diverse stakeholder space and to manage our direct and indirect social and environmental impacts. We aspire to adopt best practices in order to make BA a better bank for all of our stakeholders and not merely to comply with regulations. 
According to the findings of a Group Y employee survey that we conducted earlier this year, 85% of our staff believe that their division or branch can have a clear impact on the group's ESG performance, while 90% believe that BA is dedicated to improving its ESG performance. We are heartened by these results, which show that the majority of our staff feel engaged and enabled. Such attitude is critical as BA progresses along on its sustainability journey and as we address increasingly complex issues. Efforts have been underway by large international banks for a number of years, and local banks in Hong Kong are now starting to explore the climate impacts of their financial activities. This process has been a steep learning curve for us, for BA, as we continue to develop internal capabilities on a number of fronts, including climate risk management, carbon emissions measurement, and green and sustainable finance. We have partnered with specialized consultants, and our teams have held training sessions to transfer knowledge and skills across our organization. This year, we determined that the majority of our scope-free emissions are derived from the activities we finance. These are around 1,000 times greater than the emissions directly generated by our operations. Among our finance activities, 90% of our emissions come from corporate lending and bond investments. Measurement of finance emissions presents a number of challenges. There is often a lack of emission data, particularly from smaller non-listed borrowers. And when it is available, accuracy may sometimes be questionable. In 2022, BA was the first bank headquartered in Hong Kong to become signatory to the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, which provides valuable emission data and technical assistance. We have also taken the initiative to set ambitious climate targets. As a group, we aim to achieve net zero operational emissions by 2030 and net zero finance emissions by 2050. We have developed roadmaps for both commitments, and we will begin implementation next year. We further aim to set reduction targets for high carbon emitting sectors, including energy and utilities, by 2025. At the same time, we are also developing our green and sustainable finance business to capitalize on opportunities in emerging green industries and assist our clients in the transition to a low carbon economy. Across our markets, we expect roughly 10% of our corporate loans and bond investment to be green by the end of this year. We shall be providing much needed capital for the development of new technologies that support the ultimate goal to transition to a low carbon economy. Looking ahead, BA ESG vision will continue to inform and guide the sustainable development of our business. It will also bring our staff closer together in the process. We look forward to continuing to support Hong Kong's climate commitments and to working with our clients, regulators, and other stakeholders on this shared journey to a carbon neutral world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Zoe. Please take a seat. Um, please send our best wishes to Mr. Adrian Lee for a speedy recovery. Now, uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Charles Tsai, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Power Access Holdings Limited. Um, Power Access actually have a lot of overseas investment uh, in energy projects, and we are going to hear from um, Charles, uh, sustainable long-term profitability. Charles, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Power Asset actually is an offspring of Hong Kong Electric, and um, we have investment in nine countries around the globe. This morning, I'm going to try to comply with the five minutes by asking you four questions. You think about the answer for the first two while I deliver it. First question, a scenario. Your boss walks into the office and asks you, how is our business doing? Think about your answer while I deliver mine. Uh, share price actually is doing quite well. Foreign exchange, pound sterling is trading at 9.25 this morning. We should be able to close out the year quite well. Okay. Power prices has gone mad. 
fuel price has gone mad. But fortunately, more than 85% of our investment are regulated business. So in the distribution of electricity and gas, it's predictable income stream, it's all regulated, we're doing fine. That's my answer. Question two, same. Your boss walks in, except he adds four more words. How's our business doing in 15 years' time? Now, that beckons a totally different answer and thinking. In fact, we can use our normal year-end results. We can think about just this year. We can think about our budget, quarterly budget next year. We have to think about the survival of our business in 15 years' time. Let's start with the global. COP27, what are the requirements? What are our local requirements? Stock exchange requirements. What are our government's net zero targets? How do we comply with all of this? In fact, if you take a longer view, a sustainable view of our business, the whole question changes, the whole answer changes. We have to think about our future. We can't just think about today, we can't just think about tomorrow. So my question number three, what are you doing to help your company weather the next 15 years? Let me give you a scenario. Um, Mr. Shum mentioned earlier, uh, in COP27, we're not achieving the 2.5 or 2, 2 degrees or well below 2 degrees. Let's take it to the extreme. What happens if it's 4 or 5 degrees? The bankers in the room, a lot of the businesses won't be insurable. Think about the forest fire. Think about the flooding. Are you going to still finance them? How are you going to finance them? It's a totally different answer, totally different concern. So from power assets, we have a lot of gas distribution networks. We're repurposing all our gas pipelines so that they will be hydrogen ready. We're blending 20% of hydrogen. We're ultimately, we're trying to convert all our gas pipelines so that they are 100% hydrogen. In the power sector, we're doing everything to accommodate more solar energy, more um, wind power, more EVs into the system. We're automating our system, we're digitizing our system so that we can comply with whatever comes at us. The problem that we are facing, what we are seeing is that we can't just go in one direction. Think about what I said in the beginning, volatility and, volatility and power prices. You think about Europe, there's a war, fine. We've got problem with, with fuel supply, etc. So power prices has gone mad. But in Canada, in Australia, there isn't a war. Power prices has gone crazy. So what we have to do is not just single-handedly and say, let's build renewable, renewable, renewable. What happens on a cloudy day when the wind doesn't blow? It has to be a holistic, there has to be a system, systemic change. Government, private sectors, banks, we have to all work together towards one goal, and that's to improve our climate. So fourth question, okay? What are we doing at home to help? What are we doing personally to help the climate? Why do we have to pay heed? Because the climate is actually, our business is influenced by the climate. The climate is influenced by the way we live. Think about the amount of garbage we throw out. Think about the landfill that's building up like mountains. The natural resources that we're depleting, water supply, fresh water supply, food, 7.8 billion people. We, can, we, we, we are wasting a lot, a lot of our resources. The marine life, ecosystem, the, mean, the, the marine life, the forestry, etc. All of this is part of our living, part of our climate, part of how we're damaging everything. So we have to pay heed, not just from the business standpoint, but from a personal standpoint. So my fourth question is, if you can think about how we can improve the climate at home, let's internalize it. Let's have a discussion with our children, because it is a question, it's, it is a concern for our children. How can we make the world better for everybody? Thanks. If you can spend five minutes, think about it, then I think this morning my five minutes is blissfully rewarded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Aldous Mack, uh, Chief Financial Officer of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park Corporation.
um, Mr. Mark is going to give us a CEO, a CFO perspective, and a reality check. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, thanks Christine, for inviting me to speak uh, on, uh, today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, being a CFO, uh, normally before we decide any investment projects, um, I will look at the return rate. And compare with the hurdle rate. So normally, if the return rate is higher than the hurdle rate, then I think it's okay from the finance standpoint that we can, we can go ahead. But on the contrary, if the return rate is below, then that, that's, that will be a different story, and it's more difficult to make a decision on this. But finance indicator is just one of the criteria in assessing a project, particularly for a sustainability project. The primary objective is to try to fulfill the requirements under the SBTI, TCFD, or other requirements, which at the end enable the corporation to fulfill the net zero or carbon neutrality targets. I always question myself, is it sustainable if we just look at the reduction in carbon emission without the financial perspective? I talked to some of the corporations which got the confirmation of the SPDI compliance and asked the same questions. How is the financial benefits from their investment in delivering their SPDI targets? Interestingly, most of the response is that it's yet to be figured out. Why? Why is it so difficult to figure out uh, the financial benefits? Is the target just hypothetical? Or is the actual result always subject to changes because of the changes in business environment? I don't have a right answer uh, for now, as the science part is just at the early stage of the long Sustainable sustainability journey. Barry, our head of sustainability team, um, will present our target setting to our board of directors on this Wednesday. So what I can do is to change a bit in my mindset that I shouldn't look at the financial payback at the present stage. It is more important for us to find out what to do and how to do it first in order to deliver our proposed targets. Let me share with you two projects that we recently commenced work. This is our science park expansion, where we are going to build a wet laboratory with around 130,000 square, square meet, feet. We work with our lead architectural consultant to identify the opportunities in reducing the carbon emissions from these projects. As you can see from the slide here, um, the, um, we propose three options to consider. And if you have been to Science Park, you will know that the original plan is consistent with the design of our Science Park campus. However, both embodied and operational carbon emissions are the highest, but the cost is the lowest. Comparing to the recommended proposal where we, we use more concrete wall with less windows to reduce the heat absorptions, and even some of the components are precast in the factory, such that the wastage at the construction sites can be minimized. The carbon emissions will, can be reduced by almost 60%, but the construction costs will go up by about uh, 8%. From the carbon reduction standpoint, this stretch option is the best option, but the costs will further go up by almost 50%, which is difficult to justify. But one of the missing pieces here, uh, from my perspective, is the cost saving from the ongoing air conditioning charges and or ut utility consumption, which should be a critical element for evaluating the cost effectiveness of these projects. This is an, an, another example that we are going to upgrade our district cooling system in our Science Park campus. Our option, operation team is uh, so smart that they, they know what I'm looking for. They present um, the, um, they try to estimate the potential saving in the utility cost, uh, which is in addition to the efficient and energy efficiency, and, ca and can justify the uh, total investment of more than 200 million for these projects. The actual result is yet to see, and we will further evaluate during our postmortem of these projects. To Science Park, we have the public mission to help develop the innovation and technology ecosystem. With the sustainability work, other than the compliance of carbon neutrality, we set two um, strategic goals. First, establish Science Park to become living labs 
for partnership with key stakeholders like the power companies to explore use of clean energy with pilot use in Science Park and provide a testing bed for the tech companies to validate their green technologies with our STP platform. Second, build up our green tech innovation hub to attract more investments in green tech companies, have more high potential green tech companies and talents to come to Hong Kong and come to Science Park. However, back to my earlier point, to make an investment in sustainability projects to be more sustainable in longer term, the financial impact has to be worked out and cannot be ignored. It should be equally important as the reduction in the carbon emission. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Now we're, we're now moving into the last three presentations. Um, we're doing quite well in terms of time, so let's keep up the effort. Now, coming up next, uh, I would like to invite the uh, engineer, Professor um, Daniel Chang. Uh, Daniel is a very successful industrialist and has a long-standing interest in the environment. Of course, Daniel is also one of my board directors. Uh, even so, you can only have five minutes, uh, according, to, <laughs> according to the organizer. Um, sorry, Daniel. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Christine, for inviting me. Uh, whenever I speak, I have to remind myself who I'm speaking to. Um, for most of you, you may not know that I was the chairman for Friends of the Earth, year 2000 to year 2004. Uh, I was the first uh, manufacturer to be the chairman for Friends of the Earth. Um, it was quite an exciting journey. But today's subject is, uh, you know, according to the program, uh, Christine wanted me to share from the manufacturer's view of what we're facing. I have to thank Charles to really pave the way for us for, to, to, for today. Um, what we really want to talk about is not what we're doing today. It's what's going to happen to us in 15 years or 50 years. Uh, as a manufacturer, this is very confusing because manufacturers, if you think about the Taobao mentality, is we make more products, we sell more products. Uh, everybody's busy and making more money and uh, seems to be doing fine. But guess what? You know, if we think in that uh, 15, 50 years kind of direction, we need to change that totally because we don't have resources in the future to make products like what we're doing today. Um, to be a sustainable manufacturer, it is very challenging. Because if we would think about doing something in, in the future, you can put yourself in a picture like in a movie, uh, Mad Max in 1979, when everything was rationed, there was nothing, no energy, no products. Uh, pretty soon, you know, uh, we just got nothing to buy. Nobody makes anything anymore. We're just barely surviving. So how do we go from here to that kind of time frame? So we need to some, do something high impact and drastic. So today, I'm very happy that all, a lot of financial industry people are here. All of you are the key drivers because what does manufacturers do? We take orders. You give orders. You tell us what you want us to make. How do we make it? In what way should we deliver it? So. You are the boss. So today's five minutes, which is very important that I want to give you that message is you are in the driver's seat. All your financial friends, you have to tell everybody that we need to change. We need to change how we think, how we act. Um, manufacturers, we need to do, start everything from design. If you want to be green, you got to have a green design. You got to start very beginning. Uh, materials, you know, we think about, uh, re, uh, you know, alternative, I mean, a regenerative type material, natural material. We need to think all this in the manufacturing process, not just what we're doing today. Production. Uh, this is very confusing because in the future we'll be a minimalist. So we should be making products that last. In uh, BEC, I have just recently launched a program called Repairable and Reusable Direction. Why? Because 
if we make products that's only good for a purpose, for example, I use the water bottle as an example. Uh, most of us use, have, you know, good, uh, you know, many of us have bring our own water bottle. But you know what, what happened is when the O-ring in the water bottle cracks or being damaged, it leaks. What do we do? We end up to throw it away and buy another one. In fact, if the manufacturer can supply a spare O-ring, the product can continue to use. So just a simple example like this tell us that in the future, our clothes, everything should be repairable, reusable, easy to repair. Not what we are doing today, just dispose them. The sales concept will be totally different. And the, you know, all the consumers will be different. Logistics. We have to try to reduce the logistics, reduce all the shipping around the world. Uh, and everything that we do in production, you know, I don't want to call it manufacturers anymore. In the future, we are just providers. Because we should think about like the concept like IKEA. Uh, they're really talking about the right to use product. You're leasing your furniture. In the future, all the products should be some sort of leasing program or exchangeable program, uh, bartering, whatever. That is, instead of just making and dispose and making more and dispose more. So we'll be all living in a different lifestyle. I want everyone to picture that we will be living in a Mad Max type of lifestyle. What are we going to do? So we better start, you know, improve ourselves now. Otherwise, like Charles said, all our children will be thinking about us, not in a good way. You know, what we have, all the sins we have done. Uh, to make them live in a miserable life. So thank you very much. And uh, just one last pitch. Uh, this week, we have the Eco Expo. So please do go and visit us and, you know, contribute and learn and support all the recycling industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your enlightening presentation. Now, uh, may I invite Mr. Frederick Long, founding managing director of Olympus Capital. Now, um, Dirk, actually, I'm calling him Dirk because I know him for a long, long time. His company has invested in green companies for a very long time. I think he's one of the pioneers in the city to do that. So I think he's the best person to tell us what is green investment. Th Dirk, thank, thanks, Simon and Christine and the uh, HKUS team. So, yes, as Simon said, we're, uh, I'm a, a co-founder of a private equity firm here, which has been operating for 25 years here. Half of the investment that we've made, about two and a half billion dollars of investment, is in what I would call sustainability-related themes. So Charles and Daniel talked about one area, uh, and I won't spend too much time on that. That's sustainable infrastructure, renewables. I think everybody understands the linkages between renewables investment and, and uh, climate change and mitigation. So I won't spend too much time on that. Maybe instead what I'll focus on is two other areas of investment that we focus on. We call them sustainable cities and sustainable finance. And actually, uh, if I talk about the sustainable cities area, let me just give you some illustrations of sustainable cities, what we would call sustainable cities. These are basically businesses which have an SDG goal as a central tenet of the business, the focus of the business. So that's the easy part of it. But what is, what is uh, an example of these companies? Let me give you some case studies. Uh, water services and water efficiency, waste management and waste to energy, recycling and resource recovery, which, which is what Daniel talked about. How do you take products that have been used already and make something useful out of them? Sustainable transport, electric vehicles being one obvious example of it, but there's many different uh, domains in that area. And then um, the other area I would mention is um, financial products, not so much, so much closely linked to climate, but provision of financial products and services to underserved communities. And we actually have investments in each of those areas. So for example, in recycling and resource recovery, we have two investments which are involved in reverse supply chain for the electronics industry. So we take back uh, used devices. We recondition, repurpose, parts harvest, and data destroy, because data destruction and privacy is an important part of ESG considerations, as well as the, the ecological aspect of taking something that's already been used and making a new product. Interestingly enough, 
we still don't actually have a very good standard for how to calculate the savings from a climate perspective for taking a phone, repurposing it, and giving it to somebody so that they don't buy a new phone. These methodologies still need to be worked on, and that's an academic sector opportunity. What do you need in those areas? You must have a committed management team. You must have uh, uh, KPIs and a baseline. There's no point in talking about improvement if you don't know where you started. You must articulate what your improvement goals are. And then you need accountability. You know, increasingly, I've been arguing, as uh, have many people have, for independent certification, independent auditing of uh, the results. Because collective, feel-good stories and vignettes will not get us to where we want to go. We have to actually be accountable to investment in, results out, and how they link to the SDG outcomes. The second category for what we call sustainability uh, investment is what I would call not dedicated ESG companies where there is an opportunity to make a significant improvement. So for example, logistics, sensors, these are areas we've invested. In those areas, we again need a committed management team. We need to make sure from our perspective that there is a technology advantage that can be sustained over time. And we want to see at least a 20% improvement in the use of resources over that investment horizon. So those are the metrics. And at the end of the day, the most important thing from our perspective is accountability. So the message I guess I would give is don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. That's one side of the equation. It's good to encourage all kinds of green investment activity. The other side of it, I would say, is but we must have accountability. So success vignettes is not enough. We have to actually hold corporations accountable for their holistic results. We must also hold investors and asset manager, managers responsible for their holistic results so that we end up looking and in, in, in actually having a scorecard where we can accept, yes, we achieved some things and maybe we came short in some other areas. I do think regulation is an absolute necessity as is harmonization. So those are the messages I have for today. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, thank you, Doug. Now, I'd like to invite the last speaker of this session, uh, Ms. Christy Yuen. Uh, Ms. Yuen is head of FinTech and Green Finance Projects of HA USD Business School. Um, actually, Christy uh, and her colleagues, I think Lionel Mock is here. Uh, oh, hi, morning. Um, and they are doing a great job on you know, green talent in HAUSD under a theme-based research project on green finance. So let's hear from Christy on green and sustainable finance talent. Thank you, Thank you Christy. Uh, good morning. I, I hope everyone's eager to see me up here because I am the indicator that uh, we're only five minutes away from the break. <laughs> so on my way here this morning, I did a Google search. So putting in the terms um, sustainability manager to see what comes up. So Google has this people also ask section that shows you what other people are also asking right now. So I want to let you know what other people are asking. Um, so they're asking about, these are the three questions. What does a sustainability person do? What skills do you need to work in sustainability? And how do I become a sustainability specialist? But the real questions for us is, do we have answers to these questions? And we know that these people are interested in working in the field because they're exploring right now, but how do we reach out to them? Or are we doing anything to let them reach us more easily? Since November of last year, our research team has been collecting um, some job postings in ESG and a few other emerging industries in Hong Kong. And we've been analyzing them using AI and machine learning technologies. Among more than 12,000 ESG job postings that we've looked at so far, the top five most frequently used job titles are manager, assistant manager, senior manager, senior consultant and associate, none of which explicitly tells you these jobs are sustainability related. The underlying issue here is that there isn't a clear pathway 
for green and sustainable finance professionals. And for many employers, they can't quite pinpoint on the skills needed for the different green finance and sustainability roles. So in the job ads we've looked at, the top three required skills listed are ESG, soft skills, and finance. But these are very general wordings, and job seekers might feel uncertain whether they have um, the qualifications that are right for these jobs. Taking Singapore's approach as a reference, the MAS and IBF have formally outlined 12 technical skills and competencies for sustainable finance, which provides information on occupations and job roles, career pathways, and training programs. Meanwhile, we're waiting for the HKMA to launch the Green and Sustainable Finance module of the Enhanced Competency Framework for Banking Practitioners. Now, we can anticipate that this will be an important step in providing a clearer picture to financial institutions and also training providers on how to cultivate sustainable finance skill sets of our talent pool. Based on our recent survey, knowledge about environmental issues is considered the most important knowledge area that a green finance professional should possess. So how do we translate knowledge about the environment into skills that finance professionals can practice in their varied roles? And that's where the universities can play a part. We have expertise in environmental science, business, and relevant disciplines, as well as curriculum design. We can help facilitate intellectual exchange and break the silos, bringing different stakeholders together and encourage collaboration like what we're doing with the CARE conference in these few days. With more coordination, industry and academia and everybody can work together to create quality training programs and establish qualification standards for green and sustainable finance professionals. While Hong Kong has been focusing on training the existence, existing finance prof practitioners, let's not forget that we also need to expand our talent pool and nurture the future green finance professionals. And we can do this by educating the public about sustainability, ESG, and green finance. And earlier this year, we surveyed the Hong Kong adult population and found that only 30% of the population has heard of ESG investing or knows what ESG stands for. So how should we expect people to work, to want to work in this field if they haven't even heard of ESG? There's a lot more on this topic um, that we can talk about, but I only have like 20 seconds left on the clock. So I want to tell you that we just issued a report today. Um, this is on uh, green and sustainable finance talent. Um, we have copies outside near the reception area. If you prefer an e-copy and also for our audience online, you can download this report at the HKUSD Business School website. And Lino is the main researcher who put this report together. So he has a lot of good insights to share. If you're interested in find, finding out more, please talk to Lionel or myself during the break or after the event. And I'm down to, okay, I'm overrun. So I'll pass the floor back to Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Please take a seat. Now, I hope we are not too harsh on our speakers in terms of time. Even though, as I said at the beginning, and Christine repeatedly reminded us, you know, we are, we want to listen to short and very crisp presentation because it's such a huge topic. Now, um, I'm sure you all enjoy this morning, uh, the first uh, couple of sessions, and uh, we have nine excellent presentations in a row. So please join me to give it up to all the speakers one more time. So it's time for a break, and I'm pleased to report to Christine, actually, we have achieved some time credit, not carbon credit yet. But some time credits, I think we have um, finished three minutes earlier. So I think we can have a well-deserved 18-minute break, uh, to be precise. Please come back at 11.15, uh, and our next panel will start at 11.15 sharp. Thank you. See you later.
ladies and gentlemen, we will be restarting in two minutes. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll start in two minutes. And for panel one members, please get ready. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Panel one. Panel one. Watch all the dough. Watch all the dough. Watch all Johnny, let's all the dough. We'll put you in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, panel one is about to start. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you very much. You know, um, the senior officials have left, so please come and sit in front. <laughs> yeah, please, please, please come and sit in front. Yes, it's easy. Yes, yes, yes. Please, please, please come and sit in front here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please come. Okay, let's let's start. Again, we're using the same uh, idea of asking a panel of people who are very knowledgeable to actually all speak for just a few minutes to kind of light the fire. And this panel is made up of people that I think many of you know, and I will go one by one. And I'm going to start with Johnny Yu, who is the advisor to the chairman of Henderson Land, to give us a perspective about property development because this is one of the major business sector in Hong Kong. 
Johnny, please. Hey, thank, thanks. Um, good to see everyone. It's Johnny Yu from Henderson Land. Um, so to start with, you know, I want to say at Henderson Land, we take sustainability very seriously. You know, we have been doing this for a very long time. And as you know, a lot of carbon emission comes from the property industry. So we have to um, have a strategy in place, you know, to address some of the risks. So the, our sustainability vision is very clear. We have three risks that we are trying to address. The first one is climate change. Second one is COVID pandemic and health and well-being. And the third one is how do we promote a more sustainable city in Hong Kong and China? So in order to do this, of course, we need to have a strategy in place. The strategy is very easy to remember that we have been communicating internally, internally and externally, which is summarized in one word, or GIVE, G-I-V-E. G is obviously for green, green for planet. So we are trying to reduce the environmental impact. And also, if you were to look at our green accreditation starting from over 10 years ago, we probably have the largest number of green accreditations in Hong Kong in the private sector. And also, if you were to look at one of our most iconic buildings in Central, which is under construction right now, the Henderson Building, uh, even though that it is still in construction process, but we already achieved seven preserved platinum accreditations. You name it, you know, Green Plus, Lead, Well, China Healthy Building, China Green Building Label, we all have it. Um, so that's the strategy for green. Um, in terms of I, I is for innovation, which is innovation for future. So we focus on technology innovation as well as social innovation. When I refer to technology innovation, I do mean try to make use of property technologies such as digital twin. So in a lot of our new buildings, we will have a virtual representation of our physical building where we can perform a lot of simulation analysis and testing so that it helps us to make better decisions in terms of energy saving and other purposes. In terms of social innovation, you know, you, you look at, um, we do work on a large number of urban renewal projects. One of them is in Hong Kong. If you were to look at the street, they're quite narrow. So it's only two meters wide. So under the new construction you know, development um, plan, we're going to expand the road from two meters to 3.3 meters wide. So we're going to have a more a better experience for people who are walking around in our new project. And V and E, you know, V stand, stand for value for people and endeavor for community. So we have to care about our partners and our staff's health and safety. How do we promote health and wellness issues? So improving the air quality definitely improves the um, productivity of tenants. So that's why when you walk into our building, um, IFC, you can see we have a well-rated label clearly stated in the building. So people know that they are working in a very nice environment. And in terms of um, uh, the last strategy for community, we always have to think about how do we pro provide a more livable environment that enhances uh, the well-being and also the quality of life. So these are the, um, the strategies that we have in place that we incorporate into our day-to-day -day business strategies uh, to, you know, to focus on the three risks that I mentioned. So if you were to look at also um, some of the achievements that we have, we have already committed to SBTI back in October. So we are already looking at scope three emissions, looking at upstream and downstream um, scope three and try to come up with a strategy in, in the next two years. And also we have uh, very, very uh, uh, comprehensive targets in place you know, to um, address this. And in terms of green finance, of course, we work on so many projects. We need to work with the banks to promote green finance. So we have been working with over 10 local and international banks um, on sustainability loans. So at, as at the end of last year, we have around 28 billion Hong Kong dollars standby facilities. We haven't used all the facilities yet, but we just want to make sure we have got them in place. And don't forget, you know, um, if you were to look at, green, at the uh, environmental side, we also have to think about the social side. So we have actually executed the first social loan by a property developer in Hong Kong uh, to finance our Kong Hawaii um, transitional housing project. So... As you know, many underprivileged families are waiting for public housing. So we have been working with our government, NGO, and other partners on the first and the largest project, and the social loan was, that for, was for that purposes. And finally, I just want to spend a few minutes, out, a few seconds, just to tell you that, you know, I, I thought I still have a few minutes, so <laughs> I only have a few seconds, to tell you something, uh, which is something which I think is a good news uh, for Hong Kong, is that I just came back from Bali last month, um, I would like to thank the uh, Green Building Council in Hong Kong nominating um, a nominated uh, Henderson Land for the APEC Award in ESG, which is organized by the World Green Building Council. And I want to say I did not, we did not disappoint you. And Hong Kong, Henderson Land has won the 
uh, business leadership and sustainability for the APEC region organized by the World Wind Building Council. So I think very proud of Hong Kong and very proud of Henderson Land under the leadership of our two chairmen, Dr. Martin Lee and Dr. Uh, Peter Lee. Thank you. Well, thank you. That, that's very good news uh, that uh, uh, you have won this prize. Our next speaker is Stephanie Lowe, who's the executive director of Show On Management Limited. And I know, Stephanie, that you have actually created a new company to do retrofit. And I think for everybody here, uh, there are a lot of you from the built environment sector. We know building retrofit for Hong Kong is very important. So please share your idea with us. Thank you, Christine, for inviting me. Um, Shion actually is com comprised of two components to our business. One is real estate development, which I won't focus on today. That's primarily in mainland China through Shion Land. And the second is in SOCAM, Shion Construction. Um, so I think a lot of you know, um, in a UN report, um, the construction and built environment actually makes up close to 40% of the global emissions. Out of that percentage, approximately 11 to 12% is from the construction and materials, and the remainder from the operations of the building. So in SOCAM, we're thinking about how we can systematically rethink the way buildings are built and how buildings can be managed and operated going forward. And this is why I think Christine wanted me to come and share a little bit more about how we're thinking about retrofits. Um, so in terms of retrofitting, it's a tall order because um, even including our own building, Sharon Center in Wan Chai, we're undergoing a major renovation, a major retrofit of the building. Because the building is over 30 years old, the building hardware is to a point where you can only get so much more efficiency out of it. I think everyone here probably understands that, you know, to a certain level, um, you can, um, you know, use small interventions, whether software and such, and reduce the energy uh, efficient energy consumption of a building by about you know ten percent. But beyond that, you really have to have hardware interventions, and that involves capex. It often involves loss of rental income. It's a huge hindrance to your tenancies. Um, and in Hong Kong buildings, oftentimes multiple owners are involved, and it's very very hard to build consensus. And so a lot of the older building stock is left untouched. Um, so the way that we're thinking about it, this has to be a long-term, multi-prong mm -hmm. approach. Um, we're starting with um, offering retro commissioning services. So the definition of retro commissioning is more along the lines of building software. Um, so offering software management systems that can actually make smarter, um, IO using IoT sensors to actually um, inform tenants about their energy consumption, inform the building owners about their energy consumption and therefore um, provide more data to actually smartly reduce um, the energy consumption in a building. Um, and actually, you can, through that, reduce the labor force as well. Secondly, um, in terms of a real retrofit and a hardware upgrade, um, these are also um, services that we offer, um, but this is often proving to be a much taller order. Um, so what we're doing, for example, in Sharon Center, we're actually changing out the entire chiller plant. This is actually going to greatly optimize the future HVAC system um, and allow us to actually um, receive a well certificate eventually after the retrofit is finished. Um, we're increasing the air quality um, for the entire building uh, because the entire uh, HVAC and chiller system is going to be replaced. We're replacing all of the lifts systematically one by one. It's a very painful process, but we're doing it. Um, and all of this ultimately, I think, will lead to higher asset value. You'll have a higher tenant um, loyalty because the building hardware is actually there. You can provide a better environment for your tenants. And ultimately, we all win because um, the cost to the tenants will be less if the um, building efficiency and energy efficiency is higher. The cost to the landlord will be less over time because you're also saving. But the first hurdle of getting through the capex, getting through the owner's approval is onerous. So one of the, the you know, big hurdles that I'm also thinking about, how we can talk to the government, if you think about EVs and the Hong Kong transition to EVs by 2035, there is huge government subsidy um, and financial incentives for you to trade in your old car for an EV. But equally, I think it's probably an even bigger imperative to transition our built environment towards green building. And instead of having to demolish um, you know, a lot of the old building stock, which is not practical, how can we actually incentivize building owners to undertake that themselves? Um, and I think um, a lot more government policy has to come into play to encourage that. 
And lastly, um, maybe I can take a, um, less than a minute to share a little bit more about what we're doing on the construction side. Um, right now, we're one of the first um, construction companies, builders in Hong Kong, to actually undertake a majority MIC project. And MIC, modular construction, has been around for a very long time. But it's often used on very peripheral aspects of a building, like the balcony or just a toilet and such. But this building that we've undertaken in Gudong, which is an elderly care facility, we've built 70% of the building in MIC. And that is actually going to speed up the pro construction process. It reduces the construction waste. It reduces the labor force required on site. It provides a much safer work environment on the construction site itself. So it has a lot of benefits um, that we can see. So we're very excited that um, Hong Kong is moving forward with a lot more MIC construction, especially considering that there's actually a huge labor shortage in construction right now um, for construction workers. And so we think that this actually provides a lot more social benefits as well, because if you think about housing wait times for public housing, um, this could actually reduce that wait time meaningfully um, by about a year or so, uh, more and more uh, construction sites undertake um, this new method. Um, so with that, um, I hope, actually lastly, maybe one area um, based on the sharing this morning um, that we can think about is if these um, avoidance measures can eventually actually generate carbon credits on the core carbon exchange in the longer term, there may be another element um, of financial incentive there. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I can use the uh, chairman uh, prerogative just to add one word here, because here we have people from the uh, built environment sector, we have property developers, uh, we have elders who shared with us from a, fin a CFO's point of view, we have some policy makers here. Um, I just want to say that we do need in Hong Kong some kind of policy for 20 to 30 year retrofit of our buildings. Right, because actually the building stock in Hong Kong is quite old, both for some commercial buildings and residential buildings. So we have companies here, we have uh, a community of people here who can actually get this going, but we don't have the policy. This can't happen one building at a time. And we also have financiers here. So is it possible for us to combine our knowledge uh, and what we think is gonna be good for Hong Kong and actually generate plans for the government that could work. Because I think we've all talked a bit amongst ourselves, but what we haven't quite done is talk across the discipline so that we can stitch together workable uh, solution, workable ideas and time frame that the market will finance. You know, so hopefully for those of you who are here in these various sectors, please think about how we can take these ideas forward. Our next speaker is Lincoln Pan from PAD. He's a partner and co-head of uh, private equity. And it's a kind of homegrown uh, company. And maybe you can tell a little bit about the background and what you think of what we've been talking about today. Um, again, thank you for the invitation to share some thoughts with this group. Uh, so PAG is an alternative investment fund. It was founded here in Hong Kong uh, over 20 plus years ago. And today we have over 600 employees across the region. Uh, we manage over 55 billion US dollars in capital um, and indirectly through companies we own a, a majority share of or provide financing for and invest behind, we employ about half a million people across the region. Um, and like everyone here in this room, we care a lot about sustainability, but our issue is we're not very good at it. Um, and this is ultimately one reason I, I discussed, uh, when Christine invited us to speak, uh, I wanted to join this discussion is, how do we get better at it? Because we actually have a problem. So when people often talk about financing in this space, they talk about opportunity, which is green finance. Right? That, that's obviously an interesting opportunity which many people in this room are in. For us in the capital we manage, less than 2% is specifically earmarked for green finance. But the problem I have is the 98% of the capital we manage that aren't earmarked for green finance are under green pressure in all types of different ways. And ultimately, it all goes back to data. Uh, you know, five, six years ago, we could go and talk to our investors, which is mostly pension funds, long-term money, sovereign wealth, insurance companies, and you can show a glossy brochure with a panda and with some kids and show your CSR program. They check the box and they move on and say you've done a proper job with ESG in your organization. You know, three, four years ago, you go back and say, well, we have an ESG officer now, so an office, a manager, sort of a mid-level person who's thinking about ESG. 
you have a three, four page statement about what we care about on ESG, which you do, and they said, okay, that's good enough, you keep going. But what has happened now is uh, our investors, which includes big pension funds and insurance companies, you know, every quarter they send you a document. They send you a spreadsheet and say, tell us all these scope one, scope two emissions happening in your companies. Tell us all the waste you're producing as an organization. And the problem I have is um, those people investing in real estate, it's re there, there are methodologies to measure this. What we have in our portfolio is we have industrial companies, we have coffee shops, we have restaurants, we have people who manage buildings, we have people who do leasing, we have, we have financial institutions. So then we step back and look at this as, yes, we actually care about this, but there's no methodology or common approach we can take to measuring these systems. So then we hire consultants to help us do this, but many of those consultants aren't willing to give us a verification certificate saying that their numbers are absolutely accurate. So what is happening with this industry we have here in Hong Kong of alternative asset management, which is a significant part of the churn of this economy, is that in 10 years, in 15 years, the ability of this population to access capital from US pension funds, from European insurers, is going to be at risk if we don't have some common methodology or support to measure emissions and measure our footprint for companies we invest behind. I think many people here in this room are doing bits and bobs of it, and you know, we would welcome the help. Um, and we have our companies, which we do our method to try to help the organizations, but um, often our investors tell us it's not enough. And you go out, actually last week, we have several major global investors have come out and said is we won't invest behind any firms for the next 25 years unless they are committed to a carbon net zero position by 2050 across all their companies. Now, we are woefully unprepared as an organization to do that. And so for us to have a business in the next 10 years, this is something which we need to do. And um, I would say many uh, investors in the US, as well as in Europe, have basically spent the last five to 10 years stepping forward on this basis. I think many investors in Hong Kong and Asia are starting to get their heads around this, but certainly aren't leading thinkers uh, in this. And with this, we need the help of government. We need this help of education. And uh, one of the reasons I joined is right, we welcome the help from really anyone we can. So I'll pause there and give a minute back to right. the chairman. Well, Lincoln, thank you for your honesty, right? You know, I think this may be the sort of things that people know in your heart, but uh, we're, you know, how can we get around to doing better? I think that's your, your clarion call. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Eric Yip, general manager at the Bank of East Asia, and his responsibility is the mainland. So Eric, please share some perspective with us. So thanks, Christine. Uh, congratulate for a very successful uh, conference. Uh, the last time I checked, one week from uh, you host the conference, the weather in Hong Kong is going to drop 10 degrees. So, um, and also I think you put us in a very difficult position because everyone, I think when you're given five minutes, you try to squeeze a, a, as much information as possible. So uh, in, order, in, in order not to compete against that, I try to do something very different. Um, I try to do as little as possible and uh, just to really sit back and relax because um, I come from China and China way of doing green, just like many other things, is that they try to do the big things fast. So uh, if you look at my bio, it's actually not in my bio. I have the, uh, in, on my, on my uh, credential is that I was in uh, Shanghai for the lockdown. So uh, instead of lockdown for five days, they overachieved by 20 times. So um, they, they, they are very capable of doing things, big things, fast. And I think as a banker, I mean, we are looking at risk. So we are trying to look things on the other side, which is how can we do the small things right? So, and in order to help, every one of us to remember what I'm going to say because there's so many competitions there. I'm trying to use some acronym. So since uh, ABC must have been taken, so I use EFG. So there, there is a EFG in my mind that when I look at companies, especially in China doing green, the first thing I look at is the green externalities. Actually, everyone is doing green in China because of the mandate from the government and the regulator. And what is important is look at what doesn't work. And everyone will, will mention about EV, which is actually the EV market is dominated by Chinese right now. But there is no country in the world 
where the automobile market is not dominated by more than five players. And there are over 50 players in China now offering 190 EVs. And 95% of them don't have a marginal economic model, which means every car they sell, they're losing money. So how, when we talk about green, we also need to think about sustainability on the economics. That's the externalities I'm thinking about. The F, I was thinking about fingerprints. And behind it, actually, a lot of our speakers talk about is data. And data is not just about, as Lincoln said, it's not just about some information, not just some disclosure. I think what China actually in this area is capable of doing it right is that data is helping us to do process re-engineering. I think their earlier speakers said that, which is definitely going to be true, that in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we are going to do things very differently. And in order to do things differently, we not only need to have the technology, but also have the little information help us to do things differently. We need to understand things, process, supply chain, much better. That's why better company are, the, are those who actually can use data to re-engineer it. And remember, I mean, during my day in the stock exchange, that was 15 years ago. The biggest contribution I have to the market is that I just built a data linkage between HAEX and SFC and reduce close to 10 million reports for the market every year. So those are the little things that we need to do right. And last but not least is the G. So just uh, I have some time left so I can recap. E is externalities. F is fingerprints. G is actually Apple and mother, uh, mother, uh, motherhood and apple pie. It's governance. And to be honest, uh, Christine, I consider Christine as a very good friend, but this is for 15 years probably. But this is the first time she invited me to a conference because I think she, deep inside, <laughs> she's angry at me because when she was at the exchange, I remember uh, she asked us to do a report on carbon trading. And we, we hired McKinsey and submitted a report to go against that. So sorry, Christine. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm right, but if you look at actually the whole green thing, because everyone's so excited, we have to make the governance right. If not, it will go like FTX, right? Now, I think I'm glad to hear HAES today that they finally are launching some properly regulated uh, exchange or forum to facilitate this to happen. So in order not to make Christine angry for me for another 15 years, I will stop here because I'm overrun <laughs> of time. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, I think, uh, what's the word? Uh, you have redeemed yourself by uh, actually host, uh, uh, inviting me to many very delicious dinner. Here, here, here's a man who's highly talented. If you want to know where to go to eat, he's the guy. But last but not least is Kenneth Lamb, the managing director at Credit Agricole. And I wanted to have Kenneth here because he is in ship finance. Nobody ever talks about this sector, which is very important for Hong Kong. So Kenneth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Don't start the clock first um, because uh, when, when, when in our industry, you know, when we have uh, Christine joining the Any Maritime Forum, you know, she usually got at least 30 minutes and extended to 45. Okay, now you can start the clock. Um, I, I, I'm with the, I'm with the credit code um, for the 32 years, predominantly in shipping finance. Um, I'm also a, the, the honorary treasurer of the Hong Kong Shipowners Association. I'm a member of the Hong Kong Maritime Ports Board. So I have spent quite a bit of my career in shipping. And shipping is a very, very international business. So let me start with uh, that angle. Uh, as an international business, shipping is a necessity. Um, seaborne trade is 90% of all global um, world trade. So um, it, is, uh, it is a very, very important portion. Uh, air, air transport is 1%, and the rest is, uh, the rest is uh, basically the, uh, by land. And this uh, seaborne trade has been growing 3% uh, per annum in the last uh, 30 years. You've heard a lot of horror stories you know, about the cyclicality of uh, shipping. Um, it's true, but mainly it's because of a chronic, I would say a chronic oversupply. That has actually started slowly disappearing since 2008. If I got time, I would come back. I'll come back to that. So these fleets of vessels, um, 
that's carry, you know, the 90% of uh, seaborne trace, about 60,000, 60, what we call the ocean-going ocean -going vessels. And this fleet is uh, carrying uh, approximately 12 billion tons of uh, cargo uh, last year. Um, this fleet is worth um, 1.4 trillion US dollars. Um, and uh, the fleet has to be replenished, right? Right now, we do not have a large uh, order book, but still, the, the new buildings on, on order is about $260 billion. Um, using some you know, very rough you know, the, um, uh, um, est estimate conventional the wisdom, this uh, order book is to be the, uh, released, uh, um, say, within the two and a half years. So each year, the capex required is 80 to 100 billion easily. And this is more before the, um, all this evolution you know, on the um, ESG, because uh, using predominantly more you know, conventional technology with some transitional uh, technology, we are, we, are, we are looking at that. So long story short, we estimate that you know, by 2030, the NU, the NU capex required for um, the renewal of the fleet is at least you know one thirty to one fifty billion dollars you know uh, per annum, and Hong Kong you know will be a part of you know will be will be part of this you know um, to um, 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 to solve you know to um, to solve these capacity the issues. In terms of ESG, this fleet this fleet um, ship on trade um, approximately is responsible for close to three percent of the, the global the greenhouse gas you know uh, emission so it's actually pretty it's actually not bad we we, we ship nine percent of the goods you know and we we are only you know two or you know three percent you know of the the uh, problem but um shipping is also the um actually the um, might not be that apparent, but it's actually quite uh, um, regulated. Um, under uh, the IMO, there are clear objectives of how the fleet should, should serve the Paris requirements. So there are targets roughly you know, for 2030, for 2050. Um, but what has been uh, uh, printed, normal, um, it is uh, for 2050, the absolute, uh, um, the, the absolute reduction has to be by the 50% uh, you know, on the carbon reduction, and it's actually moving to a net zero regime. On a more important, on the in intensity targets, you know, meaning that for the cargo, um, uh, for the emission on the cargo distance travel um, um, basis, it's actually to be reduced by the 40% in the 2030 and, tw and, and uh, it's going to be reduced by 70% by 2050. I mentioned this because in terms of collecting data, the whole fleet, the whole fleet actually is under a trajectory um, on, each, on each vessel basis has to observe these, these um, targets. Um, and uh, I would say, kind of long story short, you know, while it is not antagonizing the uh, uh, clients, those ship owners, you know, who want to raise the uh, um, um, financing, but it will be true that for owners who are not going to be looking seriously into this trajectory, they will find it increasingly difficult to raise financing. I only have 35 um, uh, um, seconds left, you know, and I would just say quickly, you know, for Hong Kong, the mentality has always been to build a maritime cluster in Hong Kong, starting with the uh, owners who are making important decisions on the buy and sell vessels, on the employment, you know, of the vessels, and also on the financing matters. The rest of the ecosystem is going to follow. And so, you know, under that contest, you know, all these ESG concerns are very, very important, you know, in each of the owners' mind who make important decisions, and all the commercial principles, all the other in the ecosystems are going to uh, follow. And I think that has exhausted uh, uh, my time. I just say that it is also a mentality thing. Everybody is everybody in the industry, also in terms of operational pattern, in terms of how to improve the technologies. It's just going to be in the mentality of having more efficiency and build a better world for us. Thank you. Thank you. But well, you can see how well people can do in five minutes. Now, um, if you can set the time for another five minutes, whilst we don't have a lot of time for panel discussion, I think from the floor, you may have something you want to share with us. So can I have a show of hands for people who might like to make some comments? One, two, anyone else? Just two comments, please, Grace. Um, 
retrofit and the potential of carbon credits. Um, I think uh, that comment was followed by Christine saying that we have the governments here, policymakers here. The difficulty is for a um, for there to be carbon credits, for there to be um, there will be principles, including additionality. Now uh, the projects need to be, um, you know, will not be viable without the credit uh, carbon credit revenues. So that is something that we need the finance engineers here to think about how we can fund these retrofit projects so that carbon credits is an important element. Right. Yes, I think we agree with, with that. Um, another question over there? Oh, please. Thank you. Actually, it was also about retrofit. Um, I thought both of, the, both of the presentations were actually quite good. Um, I think we do have a problem in Hong Kong. Um, Every, every morning I open one or other of the papers and I see yet another two or three blocks that have been the corner by the URA. Um, I do like to say sometimes that, you know, the URA carry out urban renewal, quite obviously. Um, what, they, what they actually do is urban redevelopment in a rather comprehensive way. What they need to be doing is urban regeneration. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> We have, a, uh, we have zoning in Hong Kong. Every single site in the urban area is zoned. Um, but also, we, we have uh, the building ordinance, which, um, so every single site also has a plot ratio applied to it. And moreover, that is the driving force behind redevelopment. So how do we get around that? Because we're losing older blocks left, right, and center. We know it's difficult. We know that they, many of them do not fulfill the, the the, the maximum plot ratio allowed. So we have something of a problem, don't we, if we do talk about rent. Thank you. Are there, are there any other comments that someone would like to raise? Please, please, Eli. Peter, isn't it? Um, uh, gosh, uh, just to say that uh, on the retrofit question, which is absolutely imperative. And the vast majority of our buildings that will be here by 2050 are already here. So we do have to do something about it. And we have to get into the question of uh, embodied versus operational carbon in a high rise, high density city, which is very different from the balance that you have in a building in uh, the much lower density West. So we need to be thinking much more about refurbishment and rebuilding rather than redevelopment. Um, but there are mechanisms out there for funding retrofit and um, not to toot one's own horn, but back in about 2008, I set up a, a startup in London with a mechanism for funding retrofit through existing buildings. Um, surely something can be done here if we, if we accept the need to hypothecate. So I think there are conversations that need to be had. We need to get that in front of government. Stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, we'll take two more questions if there, if there are them. A starter on doing anything is to make the information visible. When is Hong Kong going to start or get requirements for companies to publish the embodied carbon in new buildings, particularly the ones which are given GFA concession? Any, anyone else? Yes, please. I, I just want to ask um, about uh, the shipping industry. I mean, you know, we're really up against it. Um, I'm just wondering what technology is really going to allow us to meet those 1.5 degree goals at the moment. It seems like there isn't a completely viable solution at the moment. Well, can we just take those like one liner, whatever reaction you might have to that? Um, but we'll go with you first, Kenneth, because you have the easy question. Christine, you, 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 you know a lot as, as well. For people talking about uh, uh, what, what is the, the clean energy in shipping, is it hydrogen, ammonia, methanol? And the trick is uh, who is going to, what, where do we find the renewable energies to produce that? And we're talking about solar, wind, or nuclear. So, what is that kind of investment? How it's going to come by? I think uh, Christine actually got um, uh, more ideas as well. I think that the answer is trillions and trillions of dollars and a lot of hard work, right? So uh, maybe, Johnny, just one liner from, from you. I know this is not much of a discussion, but, you know, um, it'll get something going after the conference. 
Yeah, I guess we all have to work together to find the solutions for the questions that were raised earlier. You know, we cannot do it alone. As a developer, all I can do is I can go back and provide feedbacks to my, you know, to my team. But ultimately, you know, I, one, one thing that I was also thinking before when I first joined Henderson two years ago, I was doing a health check on all the buildings that we have in Hong Kong. And some of the buildings are quite old, you know, luckily not many of them. So my question was, you know, what is the cost benefit? You know, if we were to put a lot of money improving the, you know, the, the buildings, are we going to get more rent out from it? But I guess, you know, we, not, we can't just think about cost and benefit, but we have to think about green health and wellness and working together. Um, to resolve this this issue, Stephanie. Uh, yes, um, there definitely needs to be a holistic, uh, multi pronged approach. So I think in terms of policy, that is some a big piece that I think lacks some structure right now. Um, and secondly, I think I'm very excited because there seems to be a lot more green technology uh, around the world and also coming out of Hong Kong in institutions like UST that are tackling some of these problems. And if we can systematically apply them, um, I think that can also be very powerful. I guess um, one reaction is if carbon credits is the answer to your problem, you haven't solved the problem. Thank you. Eric. I learned a new term today, retrofitting. In China, they tend to just to tear down the building and build a lead platinum building. So I think this is something that Hong Kong can help. I was thinking that I was going. To, I was answering the question, so I can have my one liner. I think. I, I think it's. I think it's really here. I. I think we just have to the embrace the initiatives, you know, by things that we do, and we support, you know, all these uh, ESG the movement anywhere we go. Thank you. If I can make a suggestion, see if this works for those of you who are in the built environment and the property sector. Can we imagine if we have the Hong Kong Real Estate Developers Association? If we have the uh, and I think you have uh, uh, listed companies uh, uh, committee. And then we have Green Building uh, Council. We have uh, Construction Industry Council. These are all quite influential bodies. Is it possible to foresee that we can line everybody up, right? Because many of you are actually members of multiple of these bodies. Maybe universities uh, or neutral bodies can serve to define maybe a one-year program for uh, these companies and associations to actually talk to the government. Because I think that's where we have some gap about where you think you want to go and what is in the way, right? And what are the trade-offs and what are the benefits that are coming? So maybe if we can add the financial sector there, you know, the reality check of money, you know, how are we going to do this? Maybe we can break through. Uh, and have a, 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 a different path to talking about gaps and trade-offs in how we actually do this. So, so something for you to, to think about. But we've run out of time, in fact, a little over time. Do stay, because we're now going to talk about data and innovation. So let me introduce Grace Hui, who is helping us to moderate the next panel. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> So I'm the last panel before lunch, and I have got to keep to the time timer. Um, so the first guest I would like to invite is Jim Taylor. Um, he is the Senior Director for Planning Development at CLP Power. Uh, second guest, I uh, have Jason Tu, uh, CEO and co-founder of Mealtech. Next, we have uh, Benedict Nolans. Uh, she is the head of BIS Innovation. Next, we have Jenny Lee. Uh, she's the Undersecretary for the Hong Kong Green Finance Association. Last but not least, we have John Lowe. Um, he's the founder of Asian Carbon Institute. So as Christine said, uh, this panel is all about risk disclosure, trading, and uh, talent. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Jim, if that's OK. You are the other power company that needs to speak today. Um, and uh, I would like to know, you, you guys have been um, investing a lot in green tech, and you've actually set up a new company to do that. Um, can you tell me, please, how important uh, this kind of uh, investments for decarbonization? Well, thank you very much, Grace, and thank you to HKUST for the invite today. Um, 
A quick promotion just before we begin, and that is that if you're investing in retrofitting your building for the common areas of buildings, industrial and commercial buildings, elevators, heat back, and so on, CLP offers free money. We have grants available under the Eco Building Fund. So please ring me this afternoon or look on the website. Okay, uh, moving forward. Um, actually, this is not new for CLP. Thinking about the question, 40 years ago, next year, CLP invested in a company called Hong Kong Nick, Hong Kong Nuclear Investment Company, and therefore financed the first major FDI in China with Dia Bay. Now, that investment was a brand new technology for CLP. We took something of a leap in the dark, but it's paid huge dividends for Hong Kong. 25% of our power today in Hong Kong is already zero carbon because of that investment. So that's looking back a little bit, but more recently, we've also invested in other new technologies to help with decarbonization. So in 2016, we got together with Hong Kong Telecom and founded a business called Smart Charge. Now, Smart Charge does vehicle charging for electric vehicles in Hong Kong, and that has already made some significant progress in uh, a number of residential and commercial developments to provide charging. Um, overtaken a little bit by the EHSS scheme from government, um, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it, it helped kickstart the market. Um, I think I'd like to just mention that for the transport sector, that's about 20% of carbon's emission uh, in Hong Kong, so it's important we do work on that. Um, CLP has acted as a strategic investor in a number of new businesses. Uh, and one program I want to talk about is something called Free Electrons, F-R-E-E -E, Electrons. So look it up on the web. You'll find that it's a combination of utilities, around about 40 countries are involved. And this helps bring new startups to market. It enables the utility to provide space for those new startups to try out their products in real life situations. So they can test and pilot, and they can see how they're doing in terms of that technology meeting its objectives. They can get feedback and also potentially some investment. Now that covers, I think, about 80 million US worth of deals so far since the program was established. Now I think um, close at home in Hong Kong, uh, we've established something called Smart Energy Connect. Again, if you look it up on the web, you'll see. But that's a marketplace where we can bring together end users, utility companies, and businesses to look at products which are around helping energy efficiency in the built environment. So if you're looking at how to operate your building, how to save energy in the building, how to upgrade your chillers, how to manage the building more effectively, we have software on that site which you can actually use. So looking at a more direct investment in a broader context, CLP has invested in three countries in particular, in Israel, in the US, and in China with new startups and new businesses. And that's held through CLP Innovation Enterprises Limited. And we look for technologies that have the opportunity to move things forward on climate change quickly and efficiently. Um, now, we've helped some of those companies also join up with other investors. Uh, NTRAC is a very good example of a local company where um, I think it's an Alibaba uh, Innovation Fund winner, where we've helped bring them together with other investors. Um, I also want to just uh, think a little bit about um, some of the overseas investments. Um, and I have got a crib sheet here because there are quite a lot. Um, so we're using companies like Autogrid to do demand response here in Hong Kong. Last year, we ran a mass market trial for demand response on the very hot days we heard about earlier on. Uh, we've also invested in uh, Clarity, which looks at uh, cyber security for uh, infrastructure. Uh, we've got investments in a number of other businesses in things like battery technology, um, uh, hydrogen processing, uh, software and inverters in grid operation. Um, so a number of different investments, both collectively and individually. But I think really I come back to the point um, at the start of the meeting, we talked about HKUST, think and do. You actually need both. Thinking is good, but doing is also good. So. From our point of view, we're thinking about the future, thinking about new technologies, but we also have to do the do bit. So if we can help those new startups, those new businesses, get an opportunity to test out their products, get some real life feedback, and get some support moving forward, it's good for them, it's good for us, and it's good for the environment in meeting the climate change challenge. And I'm one second left. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Taylor. So next to you is Jason, um, which his company was actually a startup when we first met a few years ago. Um, it was it started off as a fintech, it evolved from an ESG uh, company, data company, to ESG reporting company. And since uh, last year and, and a bit, uh, it's become a carbon advisory com uh, company. So please, could you tell us how you see the future of data is going to evolve? Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Grace, uh, Christine, and uh, UST, and all the organizers for inviting us. Uh, we are probably among the attendees here, the only startup uh, and a homegrown startup here in Hong Kong, uh, but we're no longer a small company. We have more than 300 people. So let me, uh, please allow me to um, share a little bit of uh, on what we do, and then I'll talk about what data is important uh, in ESG and carbon, and uh, why or how can we uh, you know, work on these sets of data. Now, first of all, Miotech is a sustainability data and technology company focused more on Asia. And uh, before I delve into the what and how on the data part, uh, I want to ask two questions about the, uh, to the audience, um, just to check if you paid attention previously to, to for example, um, uh, Megan's speech. Um, if we were to take a wild guess, how many companies do you guys think uh, have reported their carbon emission goals uh, last year? Uh, those list goals on, on Hong Kong Exchange. If I were to tell you, for example, um, only 651 companies out of uh, around 2,500 uh, 2, set their carbon targets. Um, having said that, the year before that, in the 2020 uh, reporting season, the number was 108. So it grew six times. So what do we do? What does Miotech do? On one hand, if you want to get these sets of data for your investments, um, then we supply these data to financial institutions. On the other hand, what if, uh, for example, for the rest of the companies, um, if they have not reported, and many would imagine that you know, some of them may not want to report, but the fact is that when we approached these companies, or when we represented our, uh, our financial institutional clients to approach these companies, the majority, vast majority of them, I can assure you 99% of them want to report, but they have not reported is because they simply told us that they do not have the data. So they have not digitized all their internal data and they wanted to do better, but they don't have a, uh, a, a way to, to, to do it. Uh, they don't have the tools, the, the technical tools. So that's um, in a nutshell what Miotech does. Uh, we work with both financial institutions and corporates. We supply data to financial institutions and we we'll work with uh, corporates to enhance their sustainability by offering them software. Now, having said that, what are the data sets that are available in, in the sustainability space? Um, I would like to introduce the concept of a data value chain. From, so from the very origin of the data, uh, for example, uh, you know, we have um, panelists who talk about building management where you can install sensors. For manufacturing or industrials, it's the same. Uh, you have to get into the production line where it consumes energy and where it actually emits uh, carbon dioxide or other types of emissions. And then after you can collect the data, what do you do? You need to manage the data um, in-house. Uh, and then a lot of the companies, before they report, they want to benchmark, analyze the data. They want to know um, how, what is their uh, kind of uh, comparative advantage or, how, or how, does they, how do they compare to their industry peers. And then you know, going down to the value, uh, very bottom of the value chain, they would like to report both internally and externally, internally to internal stakeholders and externally to external stakeholders. And so who are the external stakeholders? They are, for example, regulators, or for example, their bankers and investors, or they could be their clients uh, or the others, the general public. Um, and talking about how um, or how can we build this ecosystem, um, I want to share with uh, everyone that based on Miotech's experience, when we go to these corporates and uh, all the corporates, and then when we ask them, for example, do you want to do sustainability? In the majority of the case, the company would say, I just don't know anything about it. Um, and there are only three cases that they would do so. 
One is that they've been asked by the regulators to do so. And second is that they've been asked by their client to do so. So that's a supply chain concept. And third of all is that they've been asked by their investor or their bankers to do so. So there are only three reasons, hardcore reasons, that we felt that the industry um, feel the urge that they would, they would really adopt sustainability. Um, so that's partly also why I am here. Um, we are a data and technology company, but we don't see ourselves as the only company in this field. We see ourselves as uh, someone who builds building uh, breaks um, and to cultivate the whole, empower the whole ecosystem uh, to do better. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, with that data value chain, uh, I would like to move to Benedict, um, who has been so busy innovating very, um, I would say, state-of-the-art projects in relation to making the green bond market more efficient and more effective. We know that there's a lot of greenwashing, right? And uh, she has been trying to resolve the problem by working with banks um, as well as technology companies for Project Genesis 1, uh, which is the uh, tokenized green bonds, and Genesis 2, which is to attach carbon credits to the green bonds. So I'll let Benedict to talk about that. Thanks. So thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And I want to extend, of course, a big uh, thank you to Christine. I think it's a fantastic uh, event. Uh, and I would say that beyond what every one of us here is doing, I think what an event like this demonstrates is the value of, of human relations. Uh, and I think beyond uh, data and tech, which <laughs> I will talk more about, actually human relationships are incredibly uh, important. So when I look in this room, as you said, you very carefully uh, selected uh, the people and, and clearly each one of them has contributed something um, it's also very clear, as you mentioned, that it is extremely diverse and extremely multifaceted and extremely multidisciplinary. And I think that's what I often struggle with uh, myself. So while I try to uh, achieve a lot, I always think like, man, it's a little bitch in a hole I'm in. <laughs> But, you know, I think so it is with green. I think green is so multifaceted that you need people to come from their different pigeonholed uh, approaches. So maybe uh, to talk a little bit, therefore, about my pigeonhole, which became, uh, which became these um, green bonds. Uh, and in particular, looking at it from the perspective of innovation, uh, because I'm from the BIS Innovation Hub, and we do have to utilize new technology. That's part of our mandate. So I cannot come up with uh, something that has been done before. I have to come up with something that hasn't been done before. And therefore, that shows, you could say, the art of the possible. Um, after I show the art of the possible, though, I do need to rely on the markets to take the art of the possible into the, re into the actual reality. So Genesis uh, 1.0, as we called it, was a project around uh, the idea of of tokenizing government green bonds for distribution to retail and creating indeed transparency around the green outcomes and to do that with technology. So the tokenization aspect uh, would enable us actually to significantly reduce uh, the minimum denomination of the government bonds. So right now, retail investors need to spend around one uh, 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. That's the minimum denomination for investing in a Hong Kong bond, any bond, including green bonds, as a retail investor. And the reason for that is that probably in the background, there are a number of inefficiencies where uh, processes are extremely manual. And so we thought, let's take a look at these processes and let's see whether automating these processes and combining it with tokenization can actually reduce that denomination size from 10,000 to a very small amount, like 100 Hong Kong dollars. And obviously, that's feasible. We know that's feasible because if Bitcoin can be sold in very small fractions, then there is no reason why a government bond can't be sold in small fractions if the same technology is being used. So we use the same technology, which is uh, tokenization technology, blockchain, and DLT. And we built two prototypes, one on a public chain and the other one on a, a permission-based chain with, with DAML. 
Um, and in both cases, obviously, we can reduce that, except to $100. But the other things we could achieve is connect this, for example, to systems like I am smart and have automated KYC. So rather than saying, oh, I need to go to the bank because guess what? I need to be KYC. In fact, that can be automated if you connect it to I am smart. And if people don't want to be, let's say, on I am smart, there are other systems like private sector systems like Jumio that can do that onboarding now in seconds. You don't need to go to the bank to subscribe to that $100. Uh, One more thing we showed is that it could theoretically be integrated with the Octopus app. So as long as Octopus would be allowed to sell these bonds, that's the question on licensing, as long as it would be allowed to do that, you would just go onto your app, Octopus app, and you buy your Hong Kong dollars, 100 of that government bond. Why is that important? Um, it's important because it will improve the community engagement. Also, the Octopus app has a, has a following that is huge in Hong Kong. The footprint is huge. You don't need to make a new footprint if you have a footprint. The last thing it does is we can create, indeed, transparency around the uh, outcomes of those bonds. So, for example, the, the solar investments or any kind of renewable investments. Anyway, that was Genesis 1, and I saved 13 seconds for Genesis 2. So Genesis 2 took that further. We worked with the UN. We also worked on bond organization, but we attached the future carbon credits. And so in sum, behind that is the use again of, um, is use of IoT devices at the source, at the solar plant, at the renewable plant, combined with logging those carbon uh, credits onto blockchain so that the provenance of these carbon credits is established and they can't be reused, which is one of the, the problems probably in, in, the carbon, in the carbon credit market as you look forward to it. And then in some, uh, get those automated through smart contract delivery to the investor. So the investor here is not retail, it's likely institutional because this is a complex product. And on top of it, as I said, this investor, the attraction is they don't just get a coupon, but instead what they get is they get carbon credits delivered in the future. So that's where we came from and I need to hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Benedict. And if you want to get more information about these two projects, actually, you can find it on the BIS website. Um, and uh, it, it has a lot of information on how to make it work and the, the proof of concept already there. Next uh, is uh, the Undersecretary uh, of the Green Finance Association, Jenny. Um, I know that you have worked a lot with uh, your members, uh, including financial institutions and corporates. And you have always uh, uh, find it hard to, you know, really... Move, uh, move the building blocks away, right? Um, and to start really financing um, the, the green transition. Now, you have heard a lot today about data. Um, and I would like to see what your view now is re regarding the climate tech data. Yeah, look, um, thank you very much, Christine, for inviting uh, me to uh, join this panel. I think when we look at where um, the, I guess, the industry is, it's still very emerging. You know, it's really only been in the last two years that we've seen locally based um, tech companies really um, establish. Um, we've seen government initiatives like the Hong Kong Science Park um, and also Cyberport start to allocate um, monies and funds to support the industry. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done um, to really uh, grow this um, industry. And so then what we are really uh, seeing now is by bringing together, you know, us as an association, um, the government, the private sector, the financial institutions, uh, we can drive like a lot of these um, conversations and discussions forward. And so from our perspective, what we'd like to do um, with, with our membership base is to have a build capacity, build that knowledge uh, through like a series of um, say data tech and product innovation um, sharing where some of these local startups can actually um, bring to market, meet the PEs, meet the VCs, you know, um, share their experience, their knowledge, and get the investments that they actually need. Because um, I think public sector can only, and government can only fund so much, and the private sector will now need to um, step in as well to support, to get to the Series B, to the next Series, to even the listings um, that some of these companies will need to survive. Because I think you can have a great idea, but if you cannot be sustainable, um, as a business, or find that within three to four years, 
um, they are no longer um, viable. So I think that's one of the things that we are um, going to be working on um, next year. The other issue is really looking at the unif you know, unifying the marketplace around common standards. Um, I think you can have data, you can have technology, but without um, a common standard, these, this data is not comparable, it's not interoperable. You know? And so I think that is another area that also needs to happen in tandem with all this technology um, development. So we you know, are working with um, the policy, with the regulators, with the government to look at common ground taxonomy, to look at, kind of at the common nova that between the EU and the China taxonomy, and to see how um, Hong Kong can look to adopt and to align to this. Um, also with um, the ISSB as well, you know, to basically provide and push kind of like those um, common standards out to our members and industries so that we can accelerate and unlock kind of like the capital. Because without technology, without the data, you know, being synchronized, um, you know, capital will not be mobilized towards that because um, you will still have that um, potential for that greenwashing, for not being able to compare or for investors to actually be able to conduct um, the, the due diligence. Um, and so in terms of the capacity building front, I think that is also important. You know, um, sharing kind of like this information and knowledge, not just about technology and, and data, but also looking at holistically. I think people um, and the industry professional students needs to understand um, what is sustainable finance as well, um, what is the environment and, and kind of like the impact um, that their actions take. Um, and so, you know, we are collaborating, you know, as association with Hong Kong UST, you know, in um, a sustainable finance uh, program, really with the goal to also support Hong Kong as well in its mission to upskill um, kind of like ESG talent. Thank you very much, Jenny. I would like to add that actually um, the uh, HKUST has a um, undergraduate course on uh, sustainable finance, and I'm hoping that uh, with that course we will have uh, more talents uh, uh, in Hong Kong. You know, because this is going to be a really important uh, industry for Hong Kong, the green finance industry. So next, uh, we will have um, John, uh, who is the founder of Asia Carbon uh, Institute. Earlier, we talked about the importance of uh, harmonization, the importance of standards. Um, I understand that uh, you are doing something really great for this region. Can you please tell us more about the Asian Carbon Institute? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Christine, uh, and also uh, the organizers for inviting me. And also, thank you, uh, Grace, for introduction. Um, so uh, I'm the founder of Asia Carbon Institute, just recently started. Uh, it is an, a non-profit organization focused on uh, voluntary carbon credit standards. And, and this organization, it's about really trying to accelerate the transition for companies who want to reach their Go Zero target. It is extremely important uh, because what we are seeing today, and I just recently also engaged at the COP27, that the efforts from the businesses are not fast enough to achieve our 1.5 degrees target. And carbon credits, uh, to, to many of you who know what this is, it's really an accelerant to help uh, businesses to fund projects so that they can really finance projects which is actually not viable financially to reduce their carbon. And we hear many of the experts here today talk about decarbonization of the marine sector, retrofitting, how do we decarbonize existing buildings? And those are projects which is extremely difficult to decarbonize today because they tend to be small and also they tend to be uh, very technically driven. And, and this is where uh, me, myself, and a group of experts founded this organization is really to develop methodology and standards to help, um, to, to help those sectors which is hard to decarbonize to decarbonize. So let me share with you the goals of my organization. So the first and the most important goal is really not just look at nature-based solution. So in our sector of carbon credit generation, a lot of our peers like Vera and Gold Standards, they have very much focused their energy and attention on nature-based solution, which is protection of forest, uh, prevent deforestation or afforestation efforts. And this is great in a way, 
But that's not good enough, I mean, for us to achieve the 1.5 degrees target. Why do I say that? It's because there are actually less and less of those areas for us to protect. And also, if you use this concept, it is an offsetting concept where you do good in one locations, uh, probably not in Hong Kong, there's not much opportunity here to, to apply nature's based solution. But what actually they, they do is you offset, sequester the carbon in one area, and then you use the credits to offset the carbon polluting industry or businesses somewhere else. This is one of many ways of using carbon credits, but my organization want to focus more on tackling the carbon footprint at source. So we focus mainly on technology base, so carbon capture, uh, efficiency, fuel switch, which is actually the source of generation of carbon credits in many parts of the cities and countries in Asia, where you have a very high density population base, mega cities, you have huge manufacturing hubs around here. And this is where I think it will make more impact to the decarbonization efforts in the world, but also it will help to, to really address the real issue rather than finding some solutions somewhere else in other parts of the world to offset the problem here. The second goal that I want to achieve with my organization is really to work with the government and various organizations to make sure we prevent greenwashing. And there are many, many organizations that talk about carbon credits. And, and I think there is a danger that you know, some of the lesser credible organizations will tarnish this whole concept of carbon credits. In a way, carbon credits is something that should disappear if we can decarbonize the world. And, and I really for it. But, but with, the, with less credible organizations uh, you know, that, that may tarnish the, uh, the branding of carbon credits, a lot of investors, a lot of businesses are shy away from it. And therefore, a lot of the projects will not be able to finance to really actually you know, take the carbon out from the systems. And the final goal I want to achieve is really to create many more green jobs in Asia. We see our peers' organizations, they are very much focused on you know, training talents in, in, in the West and, and lesser so in Asia because they're not Asia-based. And my organization really want to do is not only we want to help the world to decarbonize, we also would like to create an ecosystem that enable verifiers, enable project developers, consultants, the really value-adding jobs in Asia that can really transition us and help us to accelerate the green economy. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much, John. And I congratulate you for setting up this NGO. I'm sure um, the reason why we still, still don't have a standard here in this region uh, is because it's uh, very hard. Um, and, uh, and you know, keep, 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 up, keep up with the good work. So I have about five minutes uh, for questions. Um, does anyone on the floor have any questions for our panelists? If not, I do have a question. So uh, when you decarbonize, for example, you are confronted with a lot of risks, especially using technology, um, et cetera. So a uh, question for you, uh, Jim, is how does CLP Power manage uh, the risks in, in the decarbonization efforts using technology? Uh, that's a, a very comprehensive question. I'll try and give a less than comprehensive answer, given that I can see lunch is calling for, for, for many folks. Um, one of the most important statistics for Hong Kong at today's point, 58% uh, of all the energy used in our city is from electricity. It's amongst the highest percentages anywhere in the world. And that means that reliability of that supply is absolutely critical. All of the financial institutions in the room today must have 100% reliable supply. So in going through decarbonization, we have to manage the inherent characteristics of different types of energy. So for example, we've heard a comment earlier this morning, what happens if the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow? Well, we have to have batteries or we have to have other plant to back them up when they're not available. If we have other plant using fuels and perhaps even new fuels, new zero carbon fuels like hydrogen looking forward on 20 or 30 years time, where's it gonna come from? What's the supply chain like? Can I have two or three different sources? That enables me to manage price and volume risk. We also have to think about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So for example, at the moment, 
Nuclear is getting quite a bit of attention in Hong Kong. It is solid, it is reliable, it is zero carbon, and its pricing is relatively stable, which is a big help at the moment in Hong Kong. So I guess look at the new, but don't throw out the old. Uh, risk is one side of the same coin as opportunity. So if there are new opportunities in new technologies that we can actually bring in, that's something we also want to look at. So that is a very quick answer to how we look at Thank risk. you very much, Jim. Um, the next question is probably the last question. Um, it's, you know, scope three. So Jason, um, how are you going to help uh, your clients to collect scope three data? Um, first of all, I think technology, as you, as, as you put it, I, there is a little bit of a risk involved in technology, but when we're trying to solve a large scale problem, technology is the best tool and the most is the probably most comprehensive tool to help you solve this. I think scope three in particular is very important because what means to scope three is that you need to establish a network. Uh, and this is how we, for example, when we work with our clients, corporate clients, what we have always emphasized on, we're not simply providing a technology that you can, for example, uh, you know, plug and play and do the in-house data gathering and reporting. But more importantly, um, as I have shared previously, how would you benchmark yourself and analyze these data? And then one step forward, how would you share it with both internal stakeholders and external stakeholders? Internal stakeholders, for example, with your employees, with different departments, but then external stakeholders means with your clients, your bankers, your investors, or even your IR overall to the general public. So I think the whole network effect uh, kind of concept in our software, uh, which we call a ESG hub and uh, Carbon Lens, a two piece of software that works on more on the, on the data disclosure uh, and the network, and the other one is more on the carbon emissions tracking part, is very important because the network concept allows all different parties to be interconnected to each other and to be able to share uh, the data with each other. Um, so back to your question about scope three, I think we are not there yet, but hopefully with the help of technology, all different stakeholders in this ecosystem can be well connected. Uh, and also it may also bring more data transparency among different parties and sectors. Thank you, Jason. So I wonder whether Benedict Lowland, you're going to take this up as your uh, next project in your innovation lab. We'll try. <laughs> Any other comments from you? Um, no, I, I, I think uh, maybe one, one point to, just to, to emphasize, which was also mentioned, is I do think that the most important is actually that we're going to miss the targets, it looks like. So, so um, no matter what, I think this room really needs to have urgency, and it needs to talk about that urgency with as many people as possible. Uh, to go back to what I said in the beginning of the importance of human relationships, um, I know each of us has been in this in this thinking process of of being a tree hugger, as people want to call it, uh, for many many years. Um, and I think honestly, for about ten years ago, there was no following in this spa space. It was very hard. Uh, I spoke then at the time about ESG, and people didn't even know what ESG meant. So I'm very happy to see ten years on that we have such a maturity in this group. Right? It's it's really fantastic. But the problem is we're not going to meet the targets. So what can we do to um, meet them better if we're not going to meet it, i.e. to stay as close as possible to the target? So I think a lot of work for each of us, really. And I said the brain power in this group, I think we should all accelerate as opposed to decelerate. Maybe that's my message. Yes, um, thank you. Any other comments from Jenny? No, I think what we do need to do is um, have more collaboration, I think, and thought leadership, and also not just to use words, but to really drive this into action. I think this is a great conference, um, and let's do it. John? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody. Um, uh, as you know, Asia Carbon Institute is, is new. Uh, please work with us if you wish to really uh, push the, uh, the green drive uh, in Asia, and we are ready to, uh, to receive you.
So to conclude this panel, um, I think we, we should just follow what Christine just said, you know, get the government, uh, policymakers, and this industry to work together uh, for a year just to bed down some of these uh, uh, issues. Thank right. you. Great, thank you, and thank you to the panel. Without um, using more of your lunch hour, I think the answer for what we've tried to do is clear. People are important, relationships are important. You're here because we have a trusted relationship in terms of uh, the people and the quality and the institution. So please go away and think about how your institution or how you can see the spaces where we can have more interdiscipline solution seeking, because all of you actually have the capability of making some connection. And we at HKUST, we will continue to contact with all of you, which you know we have been, but in a way where we try to see how we can bring people together to actually catch up on whether we can still go for the 1.5. So um, today is the end of the conference. I want to thank all our supporters, supporting organizations, many departments and bureaus in the government, of course, our sponsors, and our endless, untiring team of uh, a few people at HKUST and people who have helped us for the last three days. And then, of course, yourselves. And thank you all, especially you, for staying till the bitter end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.